Okay. Um, well, four seconds to go. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the second day of the Peterson Institute's uh, Climate uh, and Macroeconomics uh, Conference. Uh, we had um, a very fruitful first day, um, but uh, we start with a, with a panel in which I think it would be useful to recap a bit uh, what uh, our uh, takeaways from the first day are, where we find that we, we had uh, agreement or, or disagreement, um, and what are the questions that remain and that should be addressed in the, in the second day. So. Um, that's uh, what I'm going to do with a panel composed. Let me just take my people. Sorry for that. Uh, a, a panel uh, composed of, um, in, the, in the speaking order, Christian Nickel who is the, um, the head of the Price and Cost Division uh, of the uh, Director General for Economics at the European Central Bank. Um, and uh, she uh, has made a career with the, with the uh, ECB. Um, and she holds a PhD in economics from the um, Koblenz University. Um, and so she will be speaking mostly about uh, questions of, you know, what's the counterfactual, and which I think is, is, uh, is really appropriate, because we did not discuss that so much uh, yesterday. Then the next person to speak will be Jennifer Harris. Is she here? She's not yet here. Okay. So, uh, if not, it will be Beatrice uh, Veda de Mauro, uh, who um, is the president of, of CPR. And um, she's been president uh, since, uh, well, 2018, which is uh, already some time. Um, and she's made a number of changes uh, uh, at CPR, uh, not because uh, they were necessarily indispensable or urgent, because uh, she thought uh, CPR had to adapt to the new context. And I think those are very welcome changes. Um, the, uh, so she will be speaking uh, mostly also about uh, questions of, uh, of uh, adaptation, but also more, more, more broadly. Uh, and then uh, Jennifer Harris, who um, uh, served as a special assistant to, to the president and senior director uh, for international economics uh, on the National Security Council under President Biden until very uh, recently, until uh, March. Um, so she uh, will be speaking uh, largely also about the, uh, the choice of instruments. So let me uh, suggest we move to the, to the uh, table uh, so that I'm not alone and we can have a dialogue on the takeaways from the first day. Shall we? Okay. Yesterday was a very full day, very rich day. Good morning, Jennifer. Um, and uh, we, uh, I think we learned a lot, but we st still have uh, many questions that are uh, to, be, to be addressed. So the um, questions uh, are about 
the overall uh, impact of, uh, of climate action. Um, <coughs> there are different uh, perspectives. We had uh, this first uh, session on the overall impact, uh, essentially based on uh, model simulations and on uh, discussion uh, about uh, those uh, effects. Then we had, um, we had this, uh, a speech by, by Pierre Wunsch, uh, who also addressed the, uh, the, the problem uh, in its uh, entirety. Um, and then we had three specialized sessions, one on productivity, one on fiscal dimensions, and one on labor uh, and capital market uh, reallocation. But in fact, it was mostly on labor market reallocation. Um, the, the key takeaways for me are first that um, there is remarkable optimism about the long term. Nobody uh, said, you know, there is no solution in sight. We should uh, go for degrowth, or uh, there, there is a contradiction between between growth and um, climate uh, change mitigation. Uh, there was remarkable uh, optimism uh, in this regard. And this is perhaps not a surprise, given the, the composition of the, of, of the group, but uh, this is something that um, uh, ought to be, uh, <clears throat> to be underlined. The uh, first, perhaps, discussion was the one I uh, launched uh, inadvertently when I said, we don't have a proper toolbox uh, we don't have a proper analytical framework to think about those issues, which uh, elicited a, a strong rebuttal by uh, uh, James Stark and also by John, John Hassler. We said, yes, we do, we do have the instruments, uh, and, and the question is you know, how they're, they're being used uh, by, by policymakers. That's something we may wish to go back to, although James Stark is not uh, here uh, today. The third point is, um, considerable variance as regards the orders of magnitude we're speaking of. Um, uh, we had, let's mention two numbers that were uh, indicated. One is uh, the fact that a global tax uh, to the tune of $20 per ton, if applied overall generally, would go a long way or even would do the job of uh, addressing uh, climate change and limiting the rise in temperature. Uh, that's John Hassler's uh, um, estimate. Now, another number which was mentioned was this uh, 300 euros, I think, or dollar, it doesn't matter so much, uh, per ton, for this sort of marginal technology that was mentioned by Pierre Wunsch. So here, we, 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 we are facing a sort of a, you know, major discrepancy in the quantitative estimate, even if we uh, agree on the, um, uh, on, on the analytical framework. By the same token, there is no agreement I can see on the output cost of the transition. Some uh, said it's trivial or even it's positive. Uh, some say it's uh, going to cost significant output, and uh, here I'm referring to uh, Philippe Aguillon's uh, paper and his view that you know redirecting um, technical change uh, will cost inevitably uh, something in the, in, in, the, in the short term, in, I mean, in, even in the medium term, in our sort of uh, traditional uh, uh, naming of the, of the time horizons. Um, uh, so uh, that's one view. The other view being uh, that uh, we're speaking of a, of, a, of a trivial cost. So that's a different uh, and an important discussion. Um, there, there have been an important discussion on the choice of instruments to steer the transition to dirty to, to clean. Uh, there is overall, I think, uh, um, the idea that in, we need one, more than one instrument. Uh, is, is largely accepted, um, but uh, how to use these instruments is a discussion uh, we need to go back to because uh, there are different arguments uh, for having more than one instrument. One is that there are different externalities to deal with. 
One is that uh, there would be learning. Uh, one is that there is uncertainty. Uh, so all that doesn't translate into a sort of uh, precise uh, roadmap for uh, using the different uh, instruments. Um, it was mentioned uh, that the uh, subsidies um, are effective, but that the abatement cost corresponding to subsidies is much higher than uh, for, for taxes. Um, and then there's a the question of the sequencing. You know, if uh, you, you, you go for two instruments, uh, at what order should you, you go? Uh, Stephen Fries, for example, said uh, since um, uh, you, if you start you, you, with subsidies, you're going to adapt the capital stock, the capital stock is going to get greener, and therefore further uh, transformation is going to be uh, easier. There was less of a controversy on the two other issues that we discussed, the fiscal uh, issue and the uh, labor market issue. Um, on the fiscal issue, uh, the, the, the paper by the IMF, uh, the paper by, uh, presented by Hood de Moy and um, uh, written jointly with Vito Gaspar, um, is an attempt to, to sort of find a global solution to the, uh, to the problem. So it's a very normative paper, um, but um, it, it uh, comes up with um, estimates of the, of the cost of, um, of, of doing so uh, that are relatively benign or very benign. And uh, in the discussion, um, Selma Mafouz, uh, you know, compared those costs with a, what concretely is the cost of uh, moving to a different uh, system by uh, letting uh, households buy cars, electric cars, uh, by letting them change their heating system, by letting them insulate their houses, and the cost uh, of those investments uh, are really uh, much higher than those uh, presented in the IMF paper. So that's, that's a discussion we may wish to go back to. And finally, on labor markets, <coughs> uh, labor markets, that was uh, um, the topic of, uh, of the paper by, by Robert Lawrence. There was also a paper by Stefan Algat on the, you know, the different, um, 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 different ways of uh, uh, addressing the, the, the issue of, uh, of um, the transition in different uh, countries. Um, but the uh, agreement there was on the, on the uh, labor market dimension was remarkable. Uh, it was uh, largely agreed that the cost would, in principle, be small, but that those small costs could represent very significant uh, obstacles on the way to the transition because uh, that was a trauma of... Uh, of the China shock, if you wish, and the fact that the China shock was regarded as, as very small. Uh, the mantra of trade economists had been that uh, the uh, reallocation would take place, um, you know, not in a completely frictionless way, but without too much uh, uh, trouble. Um, and in fact, the consequences of the China shock uh, in the US, but also in Europe, has been major. So uh, the, the economic uh, and, and the political economy consequences. So I think there is a lot of uh, attention on how to sort of uh, minimize uh, this cost and, and how to support uh, reallocation, being known that uh, if you enter into detail, this is not an easy thing to do uh, because uh, those jobs tend to be uh, geographically concentrated, and there was an interesting discussion on place-based versus uh, uh, person-based policies. So there's still, as you see, uh, much to do to narrow down the, the differences. Um, the perspective uh, is sort of, there is a common perspective, if you wish, uh, but there, there is much uh, to discuss in terms of the, uh, of the, of the details. Um, the uh, question, uh, obviously, is that there is a need to, to act. There is a need to act without delay. 
and uh, uh, acting without having a, a clear uh, perspective on you know what are the, what are the costs, what is the right instruments, uh, what are the priorities, is uh, as always uh, a challenge. But I think uh, that's a challenge we are uh, facing, and uh, that's a challenge uh, I would wish this panel to to discuss. So. Um, Perhaps uh, those who were here yesterday, those of you, Bea and, and Christian, if you wish to react and give your, your takeaways or sort of you know, uh, dispute my takeaways, please do. Bea? Well, Jean, it's, it's always <clears throat> hard to disagree with you. Um, and in fact, I have prepared a few slides that uh, largely agree uh, with, with the some of the takeaways that you have uh, given in terms of the macro. I would, however, emphasize one thing that we have not discussed enough so far, and that will be, uh, in my view, major going forward, and it is the distributional consequences not only within countries, so those are the ones that you just mentioned, uh, labor markets and their, their trauma from the, from the China uh, shock, and is there a, a new transition shock coming of the same, uh, of the same type? Uh, but there is also the distributional consequences across the world. And I'm talking here about how are we allocating the remaining emission rights? Who gets them? Very simply saying, I have a, I have a little slide that I can show afterwards on this. Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, one reflection that I had um, after this day is also how well the papers flew into each other and basically set sort of a whole room of policies that we would have to think about in the transition. So that we cannot say, oh, we, we have carbon prices and then this is the end of the story. I think this is what, what uh, um, actually also um, was said um, yesterday. But it's even more that we have to think about the labor markets impasse, structural policies. We have to think about innovation. We have to see how fiscal policies can play a role uh, in, for example, also uh, uh, fostering uh, uh, investment and so on. So there is a whole, let's say, a range of, of policies that would play a role in, in this whole transition. And um, it's, it's and therefore, I mean, given this uncertainty um, that we are facing, um, and we have not really also, uh, let's say, much time to go dig ever deeper in, into the analysis. And, um, and that is the other thing that I thought uh, yesterday. I mean, I mean and we, you know, I mean, at the ECB, we have sort of, with uh, the arrival of um, Madame Lagarde, started sort of a whole process of uh, bringing in climate change uh, thinking into our daily work. And I can say that also over the last three years in the ECB, but also what I've seen in terms of research here, a lot has already happened. And I would also say that a lot of things we already have in our toolbox and it's now more about also trying to bring in maybe the angles from maybe meteorologists, from, from other researchers into our work that we have already done um, as economists. So, okay, the mic is already on, thanks a lot. Um, so first of all, thanks again um, for the conference organizers for inviting me to this really so far very insightful conference for me. Um, now, we've already said um, that this conference focuses on the macro implications of climate action. And I will also come to this point uh, when we have then later on a, a discussion among us. But before, I would really like to take a small detour and speak about the macro implications of the changes in climate that we are already seeing and what we'll be likely see also in the future. I mean, some discussions yesterday have already basically touched upon this. So this is a bit of a link between yesterday's and today's session. I believe it is important to bear in mind that what would be the consequences of the absence of forceful climate action. And as, as we also saw yesterday, climate change action and climate change happen at the same time, now and going forward. So that means you cannot really separate 
there's a climate change from climate change action. And this is why now I will focus my brief intervention on a relatively small or still young strand of literature on the impacts of climate change on inflation and looking at it from my perspective as a central banker. Now, before getting into the details, this is the usual disclaimer, just to say there might be some overlap with the European Central Bank, uh, at least, so, but they should not be taken, let's say, um, verbatim as the views of the ECB Central Bank. So, now, turning to my first slide, the temperatures, I mean, this is sort of a well-known slide from the IPCC report, and what we see here is that the temperatures across the globe have been increasing and climate change has started making weather extremes more widespread and pronounced. And you can see this in this illustration. The famous warming stripes that you see here represent the annual average warming. And you can see increasingly more orange, orange shades in recent years. And from the increasingly red colors um, going forward, you can also see that warming will continue in every scenario, even with the most ambitious emissions reductions and transition policies from now on. Um, this scientific evidence on scenarios of uh, future climate change underpin what the president of the European Central Bank has said last year. If we do not account for the impact of climate change on our economy, we risk missing a crucial part in our work to keep prices stable. From a central banker's point of view, it becomes increasingly important to integrate climate change in our work. This includes not only the impacts of warming, but also the impacts of climate action. This is because it is difficult to conceive a scenario in which the impacts of climate change and that of climate action on our economies do not increasingly matter. Now, let me briefly get back to the impacts of, of warming on our economies. Our understanding of macroeconomic impacts of global warming is underpinned by the literature. It shows a well-documented relationship between increasing temperatures and declines in economic output. Many different relevant impact channels are documented by now. Yet the literature that specifically looks at the relationship of climate change and inflation is still relatively nascent. There is now some evidence for inflationary impacts of hot summers, especially in warm countries, but there is also some evidence for demand side effects that may lead to downward pressures on inflation. We've also published a, a working paper on this uh, recently, and I will now briefly go into some of the findings. If you want to look for it, it's an ECB working paper, uh, number 2821. Now, our paper adds to the empirical evidence on the climate inflation relationship, where we find that temperature shocks have nonlinear impacts on inflation. We find this based on global panel regressions, which show that the inflationary impacts of temperature shocks depend on how warm it is normally in a given month and country. And here we took, for example, countries that have an average temperature in summer around 12 degrees, 21 degrees, 25 degrees. Now, the impacts are positive in countries and months that are already warmer on average, so for example, in summer. And uh, we, we basically show here the, the response that we find empirically, and the response is shown in cumulative terms over a period of 12 months, which you can see on the x-axis. I mean, you can still say, okay, this seems relatively moderate or modest in impact, I mean, what we've also done, we mainly concentrated here on food uh, prices because, or food inflation, because that seemed to have had the biggest impact in the overall um, HICP measure. Um, but uh, the main, but this um, food inflation then also has an impact going forward on headline inflation. Now, the interesting thing here is that um, we have now basically looked at sort of a, sort of a gradual increase by one uh, uh, percent, uh, by one, de one uh, degree uh, increase in mean temperature, but the question is if this basically gradual increase continues, we also have to look at the uh, impacts of extreme weather events because there is simply a relationship between this, this gradual increase uh, of temperatures and, and the occurrence of extreme weather events. And what we did here is to look at the extreme summer heat in Europe last year. And there we know 
from basically looking backwards that in our estimates, the summer of 2022 heat wave increased food inflation in Europe by around 0.7 percentage points on average across countries in Europe. And science tells us that climate change will also imply that extreme weather events will occur more frequently and become stronger. And in fact, we have already seen heat and drought extremes uh, increase. For this type of research, we teamed up with researchers from the physical science side and combined our empirical results with projections from state-of-the-art climate models that were also used by the IPP, IPCC. And this helps us to understand what will happen in future climates. As can be expected, we find that the warming projected for 2035 would imply the impacts of an extreme summer similar to the one in Europe in 2022 by around 50%. So in other words, what we've done, we've basically took, took, took what we think in terms of uh, normal climate change, the gradual increase of temperature, and then added on top um, an extreme weather event like the summer of 2022, and then basically looked at what does that mean for inflation. Now, as I said, it is important to note that we interpret our results as an exogenous effect of, globe, of warming on inflation in the absence of technological changes that will help our economies adjust to a changing climate. And in the context of this conference, this only makes it clearer that we really need climate change action at this point. Um, turning to my last slide, in summary, I mean, going forward, our macroeconomy will be affected by both climate action and a, ch and a changing climate. It will not be either or. Both dimensions of climate change will be relevant for our macroeconomies. I want to stress three dimensions in which this is important for central bankers or maybe also economists in general. First, in central banks' work, for example, projections and assessments of the macroeconomy, we need to increasingly consider both the materializing impacts of climate change and of climate action on our economy. Second, when we discuss the macroeconomic impacts of net zero transition, this should be reflected against the baseline in which physical risks materialize. And third, and very importantly, climate action and adapting our economies to changing climate will, beyond limiting all catastrophic consequences of climate change that were to some extent also mentioned yesterday, also reduce the risk that a warming world poses to inflation and to our economies in general. This concludes my intervention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. <laughs> and thank you for having uh, reminded us. You? I know, but no, I will have to question afterwards. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Question, thank you for having reminded us that uh, you know we should be looking at um, at mitigation and the consequences of mitigation, but uh, also uh, the, the counterfactual is not a world in which uh, inflation is stable and it's not a world in which, uh, obviously, climate is stable. And so that's, that's a strong reminder and I think that's very welcome. Um, Jennifer? Can we go? Yeah, yeah, if you may. Um, in some ways, that's a really nice um, point, to, point of departure, this, your point about the, really starting with the counterfactuals uh, and that's probably as much as I have a, um, a kind of bumper sticker for my intervention, it, it is that, that uh, we really need to think about um, the, the counterfactual in all domains of, of how the clean energy transition plays out or not. Um, and that's most true perhaps in the political domain. Um, and I'll just speak to the US, which I, I know best, uh, the counterfactual of um, how uh, a, a Republican led White House would handle all of these things or not is really kind of what I mean and I think will be a through line that I'll weave through this remarks. Um, I do have a couple of slides. That I, I, um, you will quickly know that uh, this is not, whatever my strong suits are, this is not among them. Um, if we can, if we can. Um, uh, uh, this, well, they're not on screen yet. 
your your spin. Okay. Oh, there, yeah. yeah, they are. I'm sorry. Uh, my my kids were sick last night, so they're even worse than um, they would be. But uh, you know, the the point uh, that I want to start with is essentially that you know, as as you've heard in stereo, and I gather from yesterday as well, the price tags are are quite high on uh, insufficient action. Um, and uh, the modeling appears to be quite hard, uh, leaving us with a, a good amount of humility, uh, which you all know better than, than me, frankly, um, that you peruse some of these. Uh, this, is this McKinsey headline in particular, um, and I'll spare you the McKinsey slide deck behind it, uh, but rest assured there's- You want to go to the podium? Um, that's okay. Uh, there's uh, many, many uh, slides that you could pull up from McKinsey bearing out all the ways in which indeed the, um, the whatever the, the 9.2 uh, trillion or um, cost of actually adequately acting are, they pale in comparison of the cost of, of not adequately acting. Um, and a second point is that we know that uh, there, because of stream, extreme weather events among others, will be um, place specific shocks that uh, will probably be um, destabilizing and have further knock on macroeconomic effects. I just uh, pulled out two here that you can see. Um, and I have skepticism about whether the modeling here, just to take the California wildfires as a somewhat biographic example, um, our, our pricing and all that needs to be priced in, uh, having lived through um, the 2018 wildfires and the, and the 2017 ones before that, um, while pregnant and with the newborn, uh, I think the, the science on the intersection between public health and um, and kind of a macroeconomic output is, is still pretty nascent, uh, but I do know more than I care to about the way in which particulate matter crosses the blood-brain barrier, creates autism, all kinds of uh, learning impairments, and I think you're gonna see this play out on a, a wide scale with probably workforce effects um, if uh, left unchecked, just as, as one example of uh, making sure that we are being as um, encompassing and uh, in the modeling of all of this as, as uh, we need to be. Um, and then to the to the budgetary impacts, just kind of rounding this picture out. This, this again is just from the U.S. This is a, a, a from a blog post that the White House did earlier this year. Um, you're looking at um, somewhere on the order of seven percent revenue loss into the U.S. budget, and, and probably outlays um, of you know upwards of 128 billion a year, uh, dealing with just six types of federal expenditures. Um, and, uh, and then to the, to the job picture, um, and th the point here is, is really that we, again, should have low confidence in the, in the modeling of a lot of this stuff. So I, I start here with a, uh, a stat from Deloitte in 2020 suggesting that if we do the, the clean transition correctly, we could be looking at somewhere in the order of a, a million more jobs. And then, and the way that we obviously, the Biden administration went about the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, I, you know, my guess, I, I, I put the Blue Green Alliance, UMass Amherst numbers here, not because I'm, I'm wedded or particularly fond of them, but I think it just shows you kind of the upper bound of the ranges of uh, job footprints that are being thrown around. Uh, and the actual doing of the thing once we have a, a, a kind of a face on legislation. And we, we uh, I, I do have a better sense of um, exactly how the climate power um, job figures were, were built. Uh, so I could stand behind those uh, more credibly. I don't know from the Blue Green Alliance uh, numbers one way or another, but uh, this was just, this, the, the last stat here is just in the first, what, five months of the Inflation Reduction Act, and you're already seeing 100,000 uh, green jobs announced, so which makes me um, pretty optimistic that uh, in the fullness of time, we will well exceed Deloitte's um, projection that we're looking at a million jobs in the US economy by 2070 if we do all of this right. Um, so I think all of this cashes out into a pretty strong argument for action. Um, John, I think to quote you from a moment ago, we need to act, we need to act without delay. Uh, but um, I think what I can contribute uh, to this conversation is the kind of pragmatism rot of recent 
ex experience trying to, to do exactly that. And, um, you know, uh, when you put all of, all of this work into the political arena and you're trying to do big things, you're going to get stuff with hair on it. <laughs> and uh, I think we, uh, you know, I would just urge us to figure out um, what are, what the bounds of flexibility and forbearance are. Uh, what the you know the the point to to an earlier comment that we're going to need you know several measures not just one it's not like there is a carbon price that will uh, be the beginning and the end of this um, I think that the the point of, is really the, the exercise needs to be um, uh, having countries come to a common understanding of the indicia of what net constructive unilateral kind of national actions are. Um, I think one, uh, whatever the answer to that question is, I think one, one portion of it is um, that you see positive global spillovers, and this just gives you one indication of the kinds of positive global spillovers we're seeing from the IRA. So um, the, um, the, the blue and green tails on these gray bars are uh, essentially bending cost curves of different clean energy technologies itemized across the x-axis there um, downward. And, uh, and so the, the green bars are bending them downward for the US only, and then you see um, the global bars represented in blue or I guess darker green in the, in the case of the, um, uh, this one. Uh, and so I think on average, uh, you're looking at, and this is, this is uh, from the Boston Consulting Group, um, bending average uh, cost curves across the clean technology horizon down something on the order of 15%, right? So clean energy across the board just got 15% cheaper um, and deployed how much, that much faster, thanks singularly to the U.S. taxpayer, um, which I think is a fact a little bit lost or at least underappreciated in some of the, the political discourse, um, the, the kind of net benefits uh, globally on the IRA, um, although it depends on it actually being successfully implemented and enacted, which is, um, I think, no small question going forward. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, I think, there, anyway, the point is there's like a fruitful vein of conversation to be had around what the other indicia of net constructive national legislation looks like. I would posit that one indicia is some amount of net positive spillovers, and I think that should be a characteristic of, you know, uh, subsidies uh, in, in general. Um, I, uh, stepping back, I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of uh, the move the Biden administration has made to rethink climate change uh, and, and move away from thinking of it as a market failure, and thus, the answer uh, overwhelmingly being one of figuring out how to price it uh, appropriately uh, in the form of um, an explicit carbon tax or fee or, or legislation or uh, regulation that, that gives you an implicit fee and instead shifting to conceive of it as a, a political problem and a technological problem whereupon um, using public investment to crowd in private investment uh, and create good jobs uh, that, that depoliticizes a lot of this becomes the obvious move. Um, now, it's true that it's easier, it's, it's a little easier for the US to say this because of our ability uh, to finance our own um, deficits and our ability to print our own currency. Uh, but it's not as if, I, I, there's a way in which some of the discourse around the IRA uh, makes it seem as if this was all just candy. And I, I, I apologize, I, I'm a, I was a few minutes late this morning coming in because I was, um, uh, doing a, a conversation with the editorial board of the Financial Times, and this the question of like who's going to pay for the candy, it went, it, given that a lot of these tax credits are um, uncapped, actually came up, and so I would kind of remind us that uh, you know it, it, there is a bill uh, associated with the IRA, and the U.S. taxpayers are on the hook for footing that, and so there it, it, there are costs that are being bared, and I think in some ways the fact that you're running it through a relatively progressive tax system uh, is, is the way to do it and spreading those pains. Um, and then uh, final slide. Um, any, any guesses as to what this number represents? Yeah. 
it's a range, but. Um. <laughs> um, this is I'm just sort of closing with a reminder here. Um, this is actually the adjustment that um, happened in the Trump administration to the social cost of carbon uh, when they alighted uh, the kind of whatever, whatever mathematical gymnastics uh, they went about, uh, they reduced the social cost of carbon to an estimated one to seven dollars a ton. And um, I just, I, I like to go back to this number as a very, um, you know, uh, pressing, urgent reminder of the need to lead with the politics and, um, and make sure that we're getting the politics of the clean energy transition right, <coughs> certainly in, in, the, in the U.S., uh, in order to make this as sticky and as durable as possible. Um, and uh, that means that we're just not in the world of uh, first, best, most efficient ways of um, developing answers to these things. And, and in some ways, I, I kind of like to fight this question of uh, are things like carbon border adjustment mechanisms or the domestic content provisions, the adders that are on uh, portions of the IRA, the most efficient way of going about all of this, um, I actually think the answer is yes, because when, when tested in any real world scenario of uh, how long it would take, I see no viable path for an explicit carbon fee in the US. Um, you know, and, and it hasn't happened in my lifetime and, I, and things are getting worse, not better on that front. Um, so uh, I, I would, would, would posit that actually this could well be the most efficient um, of any of the plausible alternatives and the stickiest to be sure. So um, I will leave you with that. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. We we'll certainly go back to several points you addressed. Uh, but before that, I would like to give the floor to Bea. Thank you very much, Jean, <clears throat> um, Adam, uh, for having me here. Uh, it has been an absolutely uh, fascinating first day and uh, a lot of interesting uh, papers that um, I still will, I already know I will assign to my students, most of them. Um, so my job, uh, as I understood, was to give my interpretation of what is the takeaways in terms of what do we know by now on the macroeconomics of climate change and climate action. And so I want to start where we all need to start is what do we understand by now on the impact of CO2, mostly CO2, there are other greenhouse gases um, on average temperatures. And this is fortunately by now quite well understood. This chart you have seen if you were here for John's uh, presentation yesterday. This is from the IPCC. The historical temperature range and the cumulative CO2 emissions and rolling this forward, we have a quite good understanding of where we are going under different scenarios of how much we are still emitting and accumulating further CO2. Um, the good news here from this IPCC is that this is a little bit flatter in terms of the more extreme accumulation parts are no longer seen as the most uh, important ones. Um, and nevertheless, if we take this now, and we see also there is a bit of uncertainty. I, um, I do actually read this as a relatively small amount of uncertainty. Uh, given that sometimes people go like, we don't know anything, we know quite a lot the amount of uncertainty of what is the human co uh, cost range of the accumulated CO2 in the air is rather small. But now let's cut this the other way, and that's the sh uh, table I did want to start on because it seems to me it's the most important table in the world. <laughs> it's really uh, the... E the way to understand what this means in the previous uh, chart, now cutting, cutting this chart across different temperatures and looking at what this means and how much is left for us to spend. This is the carbon budget, right? The carbon budget, so we've used up 2,400 gigatons, and I really, really want to uh, encourage everybody to think in tons. Um, once we start understanding what tons of CO2 mean and what are the dimensions, it makes the conversation so much easier. So this is all about the gigatons. 
2,400 gigatons up have been used up or have been uh, accumulated. And uh, that means then the chart is read or the table is read the following way. If uh, we want to stick to the target of 1.5 of Paris, uh, then we have about half a degree left to go because one degree is already in the bag. And um, that then translates into, his, here's where you see the uncertainty. They translate into different probabilities of reaching this 1.5 degree target. So if we go for high certainty, which usually, you know, in our statistics, we want 99%. So let's, let's just go for 80%. 80% certainty of staying below 1.5 would mean there were 300 gigatons left. Now, this is already two years ago, so we should, we should actually uh, take away about 80 because we are using about 80 uh, per year. And the emissions have not, or per year, it's 42 years gone. So... Uh, 80, um, 35 tons are from, uh, from fossil fuel and uh, 40 uh, uh, or five additional from, from land use change. And so if that, is the, if that is the number, you know, 300 minus something um, in order to be at 80% certainty, or if we want to be more generous and say, well, 50% is good enough, for 1.5, then we have 500 gigatons. In fact, you know, I tend to use the 500 gigatons, which also seems to be the one that you use uh, most, uh, uh, John. So, so this is, why is this table so important? Because it shows that's it, you know? It is irreversible. It's, it's, an, it's a cumulative process. If we do more than 500, then we have a higher outcome, and it's going to stay for the next 100 years, if not thousands. And that is the, the background against which, once I think this sinks down, it is no longer a question of marginals. It really becomes a question of what are the risks that we need to avoid today in order not to burden the really distant future, not only our children, grandchildren, but the ones that are going to be living in the next hundreds of years. So this is the carbon budget now. These 500 gigatons, and I, I'm going to come back to that, uh, that we have left, and we have a way to think about how we are going to be using them. Now, the second question is, um, what is the output impact of no mitigation? And here, the, the, uh, the uh, estimates are rather large. So, um, you know, one of the biggest estimates is from Burke and uh, co. Uh, and, but even here in this, you know, it's not happening in the next few years. It's not happening, in fact, in our lifetime. It's beyond it. By 2100, it starts, you know, be becoming really large. So one way of looking at this is to say, well, you know, um, well, the future is the, is, is, is the problem, uh, not, uh, not uh, us right now. Um, similarly here, you know, if you, go, if you go far out, you can get very, very large output declines, up to 25% uh, of GDP from the more extreme scenarios of going over and, and you know, having temperature increases in the area of 4 to 5 degrees. Um, the, but the variation of the different uh, studies is also quite large. So here, this is stim still on all about the, uh, for the counterfactual, you know, we were talking about before. What are the variation? Well, there are very large output effects, but there are studies that have rather small ones, even for the long run. And that is, of course, what makes uh, things not so easy uh, to argue. But the, the, the bulk of the studies seems to focus on somewhere like, you know, 5 to 10, uh, um, 5 to 10 percent of GDP uh, output decline over the long run in the case of insufficient action, let me put it this way. But now come also already here, there are quite these, these averages for the globe. I think I would start arguing, as, as I will continue arguing, is not really the, the interesting point. Huh? It's quite different whether you are already a hot country, so geography matters, or whether you're not. So the slopes of what temperature increase does to your GDP per capita loss is quite different whether you are red or whether you are blue. So where you are sitting now matters uh, for, the, for how large the uh, GDP impacts are of no action or insufficient action. 
Here is the study for the European Union, this peseta that John was also quoting yesterday. And when you read here the main takeaways, you know, the tundra essentially disappears, Europe in the south becomes almost tropical, and 300 million citizens in the EU and UK would be exposed to heat waves. Well, that sounds pretty big. Uh, but then comes the, you know, Conclusion, this is a welfare loss of today's economy without adjusting of 1.4 to maximum 2% of uh, GDP. And then you go like, wow, that's not so much again, right? <laughs> so so that, there, that's a lot where a lot of confusion comes from. So uh, the models are not here. This very, very good study, which comes from bottom up, does not imply a huge welfare loss. So maybe what is more important is how it is distributed across the European continent in this case. Because uh, in, in the south, it is much, much larger. And I'm not including the mortality here, uh, because that is actually the biggest uh, piece. Uh, so I'm just using the other, you know, uh, the other natural, uh, natural consequences of different degrees of climate change. And you notice that in the Northern Europe, there is also some benefits. So the distribution, geography matters, the distribution is important. Um, now back to averages, output impact of mitigation. And that is, I think, most of the papers that we have seen, um, really most of them suggest the impact of mitigation is smallish. Yeah? And so I'm using here the study done uh, in the, for the uh, WIO in October 2020. This is, uh, is uh, McKibbin, Wilcox um, with G uh, GCube. So they simulate different individual types of, uh, of uh, mitigation policies and then combine them into a package. And the conclusion, again, is it's not very big. In fact, the, the pattern there is that you get a bit of a growth boost at the beginning, and then there are uh, output costs. But let me emphasize again, you know, there are distributional issues here. It's not, it's not the same across countries. It's not the same across regions. From this same model that I was showing before, you see that two areas are actually quite affected. Um, one is Russia, and the other one is, uh, is uh, oil-producing countries. So are we assuming that they are also in the boat um, with these kind of packages? Probably not. So actually, in their study, there are co-benefits, which mostly occur to these countries that I, I, I didn't quite understand why then somehow it, it, uh, it, it, it levels out. Uh, but again, I'm emphasizing here differences across the world. Price impact um, uh, of, uh, and inflation impact of mitigation, I, I mean, I. Uh, I, I studied these things mm -hmm. myself. This is from our paper on greenflation and uh, past carbon taxes in Europe and, uh, and, and uh, Canada. Bottom line, yes, there is a relative price impact, so it works, carbon taxes work, but uh, the overall inflation impact on, uh, on headline inf is, is on headline inflation, mostly not on core of course, not on headlines. So overall, the inflation impact, and this is my uh, this is my <laughs> co-author who went on then with Kensig, the of Kensig, to do the same thing, carbon taxes and combining the ETS system, the shocks to inflation and uh, are, are smallish and transitory. Nothing that central banks couldn't deal with. I'm saying not. I'm not saying central banks don't have to worry about it. Yes, they have to model it but they can absolutely deal with it. And this is the, another simulation with uh, Warwick McKibben this case. time. We did a, uh, a European version of his G-Cube and, and tested different types of monetary policy adjustments. You see you can get inflation or deflation in response to a carbon mitigation. This is a carbon tax, um, depending on how the central bank, um, how the central bank reacts. Um, but in all of these cases, my conclusion would be not our prime worry. Um, OK, in the near term, a lot depends on how you, uh, on, on how you model. This is, the, this is the wheel from now on how you uh, model the mitigation. So different carbon prices across the world and across regions. Um, notice biggest impact is, so even though they, the rest of the world doesn't need the biggest carbon tax, it still has the biggest output impact. And under certain, uh, under certain uh, uh, conditions also, 
the biggest inflation impact, but this is still muted. So I, I'm going quickly through this because I want to uh, get to my last two points. This one here is uh, what Jennifer was just uh, discussing. So transition costs, mitigation plus adaptation. Well, where are they? Um, I'm saying here, you're know, looking across different different studies, one to three percent of global GDPs. This is a huge contrast with what the McKinsey um, the McKinsey study that adds up to 275 trillion. But of course, there's lots of double counting in in McKinsey in the sense that not much is actually additional there. It's on, uh, out of nine trillion that they have on investment in transition. Uh, three would be additional, so we're talking more like three percent of GDP um, of additional. Uh, and and by the way, a lot of it could also be by the privates. So, so now I'm getting to the point: uh, the distributional implications across the world, and geography matters. Most of the impact of cl climate change is going to be in the countries that are dark here, so mostly in the tropics, and. On the other hand, here is what the, the distribution of the emissions today looks like. Uh, you see that in the tropics, there is relatively little that uh, is being emitted and contributed to today's, uh, to today's uh, emissions. And now what I've done um, is the following. I took the total carbon budget of 500 gigatons, being a bit generous here, and distributed it across the different countries or regions of the world according to what would be the implied carbon budget per capita from sticking to net zero. So you remember the, the volcano chart yesterday from Turkey? Well, that's what I'm doing here implicitly. I'm giving Turkey and each Turk the share of the remaining carbon budget, which is a function of how much they are emitting today as a part of, their, of the total emissions because that's what net zero means. So those who are emitting a lot need to go down a lot, but they also have get a lot on the way there. And so now doing this per capita. So John yesterday talked about the EU being fine. So the EU about with the um, Fit for 55 uh, has actually in, embedded a, uh, a, uh, a carbon budget per capita of about 70. According to this calculation, it could actually even be 88. But that's it. Huh? For every single one of you, 88 <laughs> Europeans, that's all you get to so start calculating how much you can fly. Um, and, um, and, and for the world, if we, di if we distribute it equally across the world, it would be about 60. Every single person gets about 60. And it doesn't matter if we use that up by 2050 or by 2060. It doesn't matter because it is cumulative. It's how much there is left. Now you notice that there are um, some inequities in this, right? So implied in our present net zero strategies and NDCs is that uh, a Chinese gets much more, a Russian actually gets much more uh, as, a, as a total carbon budget. And Africa, this is a, just an estimate, rough estimate I did, and Africa, for people outside South Africa, gets about 10, uh, 10 a budget of 10 tons uh, forever. So you see, this is, this, this, this is not feasible, right? <laughs> so either we get a, a carbon, well, we, there's many things you can do with this. You can say, well, let's have a carbon market. So we give 60 to everybody, and then let's trade. And that would be, that would be, of course, one solution. Uh, but this is, we mo notice that this is climate inequity forward-looking. I'm not talking about what has happened in the past. This is the forward-looking under the assumption that we actually stay within the carbon budget. Somebody will be able to use this up, and who is it? So I, I submit that this is the biggest question we should be thinking about. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. We have about uh, half an hour uh, for the uh, general debate. Before that, let me, let me go back to sort of the, the core issue we are, we're discussing. Uh, you repeated that consequences of uh, climate change mitigation for output and inflation are bound to be smallish, uh, so insignificant. Um, this is based on uh, model simulations uh, and what 
I'm not, where I'm not comfortable uh, with this result is that it's not explicit enough about the underlying mechanisms. Uh, by which I mean, you know, how much uh, of your, um, um, let me distinguish between uh, uh, output and inflation. Uh, on, on output, it goes back to the discussion we had about productivity and the fact, uh, you know, that we, uh, we need to, to, to discuss whether there is a, uh, a diversion effect uh, away from the kind of technical progress we used to. Uh, towards a, a new type of technical progress, which is to, to save on fossil fuels, but which is bound to have a, an output cost. On inflation, um, and here perhaps I'm going to ask especially Christian, um, Isabel Schnabel is on record saying that uh, the climate transition, um, at least for the next 10 years, is going to uh, mark the end of the Great Moderation. There is going to be a period of great volatility because uh, the transition is, you know, just by nature bumpy. Uh, because uh, you have to to change your energy system, uh, you have the problems of mismatch between the green and and, and brown investments. You're probably not investing enough uh, in general at global level because you have all the scarcity. Uh, of the materials that are crucial for this uh, green economy. So we can be very optimistic about uh, the, the medium and long run, but the next decade uh, is likely to be, to be bumpier. So that's sort of the kind of um, uh, question I would wish you to react to. Uh, no, no, indeed. Um, I would also say that, that, and we heard that already yesterday, given the uncertainties that we have, not so much on um, the forecast of how the weather will change, but on how, you know, climate change action will, will go about, what it will mean in terms of also the adjustment of the economy. Indeed, um, th there is the risk uh, of, 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 of these bumps, and also that there might be policy mistakes, given that this is sort of a, a, an unprecedented transition that we have to go through. So this transformation that we are, that we, that lies ahead of us is, is something very unique. There is no precedent for that. And th therefore, there is also some risk, let's say, of, of policy mistake. Coming back to the issue of, yes, the inflationary impact, and they would agree, and this is also the finding of our paper, is on average, if we have this gradual increase in temperatures, relatively manageable. Huh? But what, of course, is happening with this, let's say, increase of, of, of or gradual increase in temperature is that simply by scientific evidence, we know that this also will bring extreme weather events. This will bring flooding, this will bring uh, droughts, and, and these kind of extremes they can amplify then also the effect of inflation. Now, the issue is for us in terms of modeling and so on, we have, uh, let's say, little problems let's in putting in gradual increases in, in, in these weather uh, events, et cetera. But when it comes to extremes and, uh, uh, you know, these bumps that you mentioned, then there is a problem also in terms of modeling. And then we are sort of, this is why also when we look at then error ranges around our estimates, they are rather wide. And so you cannot exclude that even though, let's say, in, in, in this gradual uh, changing world or structural change, uh, that, that yes, uh, everything runs relatively smoothly, but if there are these extremes, these bumps, we will have an impact. Thank you. Any other reactions from the, the panel? We would... I, I can only agree this, uh, I mean, higher volatility, not only for in terms of prices, I mean, for all the reasons that we have also discussed, uh, there can be bottlenecks, but there is also, I mean, already with one degree warming, and it's going to be more, even in the best case, uh, more extremes and more shocks are going to happen, and that's going to mean more uh, volatility for output and prices. I think that's, uh, that is uh, clear. Jennifer? Yeah, I, I would just want to um, inject a, a note of uncharacteristic optimism on the importance of uh, policy choices and, and the design of how all of this hangs together. A couple of different examples to put some color on it. Um, if, you know, I think we're already seeing a kind of warranted 
unwillingness on the part of uh, oil and gas majors to put a, a lot of capital expenditure in new infrastructure, and that's that needs to happen as part of how all of this goes, so I think to be welcomed, but that's doing a lot of the work, I think, behind a lot of the volatility um, in um, traditional energy sources in this transition. Uh, there are there are known government interventions that can be you know um, brought out, and I think we can we could push lean in harder on some of those. So, you know, uh, free public transit. When you see gas prices rise to a certain above a certain level, that's not going to you know be a panacea certainly in the U.S. Uh, do I think uh, much better go further in places like Europe where you have a more responsible public transit system, but. Um, it's, uh, it's material. Uh, I think you're seeing um, price volatility in things like critical minerals on the other side of the transition. And likewise, we have like time-tested playbooks about how to deal with pr price chop in essential commodities going back to Roman agriculture. Spoiler, it looks a whole lot like price insurance. Um, that we should be uh, thinking about more aggressively, more quickly than we are looking just at lithium. Uh, over the past couple of years, you've seen lithium prices in spike about 800%. They've softened a, a, a fair bit, and we talked to mining majors about why they're not uh, investing at the clip needed given clear demand signals that are kind of flashing in neon. This is a version of what they say. They basically say we have PTSD from the commodity downturns of 2014, and um, our shareholders are making money again, thank you very much, and we're pretty sure that China will figure out a way of um, dumping on the market, even though they themselves are a net exporter. We don't know how yet, but um, you know, if passed as precedent, uh, that will be there. And uh, I think there's a, there's a, a clear role for uh, forms of public insurance um, that can make all of this go better. The last example in the US, looking at the political economy of utilities, right? gas utilities have a mandate to serve everybody. Uh, and so if you, if you see uh, homes electrify on the home retrofits that are as part of the IRA uh, anywhere near according to plan, you're going to take away a lot of those middle and upper income ratepayers that are currently subsidizing a lot of the lower income uh, gas customers in the U.S. and that's going to make gas bills rise for the people who can afford it least. Uh, and there are easy ways to get ahead of that by uh, figuring out how to go in first and get some of those communities off of gas. Uh, likewise, I think keeping utilities together, combined electric power, power utilities and gas, help the political economy of those entities in this because they can, uh, as, you know, they can basically just green their asset base as gas becomes less feasible, as long as they're cleaning up the grid uh, in the way that they already are, uh, they should be able to recoup a lot of those losses, and that, that will make them a more constructive player in how all of this goes. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see Philippe Aguillon uh, and Robert Lawrence. And Suman Berry. I have a question I had. I mean, uh, if it's true that, uh, you know, uh, global warming will... Uh, raises inflation risk and uh, risk of price instability. So that might have impact on the way to conduct uh, monetary policy. For example, we used to say, you know, int raise, rising interest rate is a way to fight inflation. We know it's, in, it's one of the ways. But now we have to factor in the fact that if we increase interest rate too much, that might make, you know, discourage green investments. We know that uh, uh, I'm doing some current work, in fact, uh, with Martin Derrider and other colleagues at LSC, John Monrinan, where we show that uh, harder finance, tighter finance, particularly makes it harder for small firms to innovate green. So you have to factor that in now in your way to conduct in because it could be that if I raise interest rate too much, I delay those investments, so I prolong global warming and therefore I get more price instability and uh, inflation. So it'd be interesting to see how you factor. That. Similarly, on debt, we know that yesterday we are we argued in the work with Darren and uh, David, and if you delay action, you increase the cost of. Uh, of, of, uh, so, for example, you could say, well, in the, to reduce my current public debt, France, for example, has high public debt. Because of that, to, to follow Maastricht, the Maastricht Treaty to the letter, I might want to delay uh, some, certain kind of investment to remain within the, you know, the, the 3% or whatever. But if by doing that, I increase you know, the cost of transition tomorrow, uh, that's not good because there is the monetary debt, but there is the environmental debt. And now you have to look at both together. And there is raising demand for not counting green investment the same way as you count, you know, uh, recurrent spending or other things. So how you do, how we deal with that? Uh, and the third thing is that something we did not mention uh, is Plan B. 
Uh, you know, the, 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 I know that we look strange in this conference. I mean, there, there is research in Harvard, but in other places, uh, to, for ways to cool down the atmosphere, actually. Uh, and uh, it would be very interesting to say what happens if we factor in plan B. And of course, we don't want plan B to discourage plan A. And the question is, is plan B something we should just, you know, don't ask, don't tell, don't mention it because it would, uh, you know, derail any plan A action? Or do we believe there could be some complementarity between some plan B and some plan A? But we cannot do as if plan B doesn't exist because there is research actively going on uh, for cooling down the atmosphere. And so it would be very interesting to see when you factor in plan B. Uh, you had in your scenarios, your most pessimistic scenario, your more optimistic scenario is maybe too, too pessimistic because maybe there is this research that we can also have. Those were my questions. Thank you. Okay, Robert. Let's go to Robert Suman and then back to yeah. the panel. I, I think this was kind of a gap in our discussion yesterday already. Um, when the modeling was done on um, climate change action, uh, they were putting a price on carbon, and it was uh, raising a lot of money for the FISC as a consequence. But if we actually look at the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, what that's doing is draining a whole lot of money from the FISC. And if you look at the estimates, basically no one has the foggiest idea about how much that's really going to cost. The Congressional Budget Office estimates, you know, were on the order of, I guess, uh, I think it was 270. Is that the number? Catherine yeah. is on top of all of this. Um, you know, but by the time uh, Credit Suisse was finished, it was, I think, closer to 800 billion. And by the time Goldman Sachs was finished uh, calculating this, it was 1.2 or 1.3 trillion dollars. So actually, um, it isn't really an Inflation Reduction Act if Goldman Sachs is correct. It's an Inflation Resuscitation Act because it's really um, uncapped subsidies uh, which have been provided. So it does seem to me that if we were to think of it in those terms, in terms of what's happened in the United States, and I don't see much hope, and I would agree, in terms of the politics, that the United States now suddenly imposes a tax after having committed it itself for, for 10 years at least <coughs> of these subsidies, um, we have no control over those subsidies. And so I actually think there is an inflationary, a traditional inflationary problem of fiscal, coming through fiscal policy, which hasn't been in this discussion so far, and uh, imposing discipline on the FISC, in a sense, is, is an important, uh, in my view, a, a priority. And I don't think the recent dispute over the um, debt limit, which was all focused on government spending, actually covers government tax breaks. That's a, that's, that's something the Republicans don't seem to be worried about. So I think the United States is in danger of um, a, a significant uh, lack of discipline, and therefore the inflationary pressures in, in the intermediate run could be much larger than we're talking about. <coughs> May I? Okay. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Was that me? Or? You. Yeah, okay. Fine. Uh, just, uh, I, this is to Beatrice, but uh, perhaps, Jean, you want to come in as well. So uh, I was a little unclear what this chart about, uh, as it were, uh, the allocation of carbon by, uh, uh, by nation uh, reflected. Uh, I assumed it was the NDCs, uh, and that's what's uh, implicit there. But uh, my question was how to link this with my takeaway of what uh, John had to say yesterday, which is that speeding up the uh, adjustment in, say, the EU would be inefficient. Okay, so Jean, uh, I, you know, either you, Beatrice, or you, Jean, or uh, John, might want to uh, connect these two. So is there an inefficiency in going to a more equitable distribution of the remaining carbon budget? I'm, 
I'm a little lost. Okay. <clears throat> so, who wants to start? Perhaps uh, um, Christian, because there was a question directed at, uh, at you. Um, yeah, on this question of, uh, I mean, it, it, of inflation and, and monetary policy and, and what, what could be sort of, what would that mean for our policy making? I mean, one thing is in, indeed, first of all, um, what I presented here was in, that, that we take this phenomenon of climate change, climate action now seriously and try to embed it in our models, just <laughs> like we would do it with other structural changes that we see in the economy. Um, and when you talk about the, the impact that that would have on monetary policy, so when we look then at the modeling, where we would not just look at the impact of climate change, but also of other structural changes that are going on in the economy, be it demographics, be it digitalization, be it deglobalization now, et cetera. Now, and that in, in, in such a world where, where you, you basically have to look at all these different factors that are going on, including then also the conjunctural factors and so on, I mean, it's, it's very hard, basically, to say what, what is then the impact overall on monetary policy. I mean, if you say it's simply uh, uh, in a ceteris paribus world, then and we see that this is in, in, indeed having a positive impact on inflation, then this is, of course, uh, has an impact also on our policy making because uh, or we would raise rates or whatever. Um, simply because we are, we are not, um, yeah, we are not uh, uh, adhering to our monetary policy target that we have. Now, in terms of uh, discouraging, then at the same time, uh, in investment, I, I think that that is a this is a fair point, huh? um, and this is also why I think it's important to have this integrated into the models to in, in exactly have this kind of connection also, uh, basically in there in in the in the back of our mind. Nevertheless. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, our, our, we have a price stability objective. Huh? So uh, uh, that, that is our primary objective, and this is what we, we have to adhere to. I mean, also to just say, sometimes we say, oh, this inflationary impact is very small. I mean, you heard just that, that until a year ago, I was head of the prices and cost division. We have um, very much, I mean, whenever we have a forecast error of 0.1 percentage point, we already have a problem, huh? I mean, or two percentage points, or, or, or 0.2 percentage points. I mean, we're tracing uh, um, back where, where is it coming from, and therefore, not to look at uh, climate change, even if the impact is small, uh, could have, uh, yeah, could I I imply a policy mistake possibly. And then uh, you asked this question, and I thought that is interesting: uh, is this question of the delayed action, uh, 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 and that this brings more costs. And indeed, when we look at the fiscal sustainability in Europe, I mean, we, we see that a lot of uh, countries have actually little fiscal space. And then when you look at my map um, that, that I showed, that you see, for example, Italy is one of the countries that might be impacted most from climate change. Um, you, you realize there is sort, sort of an overlap here between, on the one hand, a country here with already existing fiscal sustainability uh, uh, issues or high, high public debt, and at the same time, also these large uh, uh, investment needs. Huh? Um, the, the thing is, uh, uh, we are at the moment discussing uh, um, sort of uh, this whole uh, this, this economic governance review. Um, that is something where we would like to bring in also this aspect that, that investment should be shielded and that we are not seeing with, let's say, stronger rules, uh, an effect that actually investment is cut down, which we have seen basically uh, in, in previous crises. But this is sort of uh, still, let's say, in the in the making. But let's just just to say that this is something that 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 we are uh, uh, aware of. Huh? And on um, uh, yeah, me. yeah, Please. yeah, time is is short. Yeah. Um, can I give the floor to Jennifer to answer the question by Robert? Right. Uh, this was on the um, inflationary pressures yeah. uh, of the IRA. Yeah, I think it it um, really comes down to whether uh, you find. Um, supply side progressivism, whatever you know, I think best articulated by Secretary Yellen, credible or not, uh, really, I think the, the place to start is before um, this bout of current inflation. And you know, when you look at the the primary preoccupations of uh, most macroeconomists following the U.S. 2016 to 2020 was all secular stagnation, right? Uh, and then it became the first two years of the Biden administration all about inflation. And I think uh, 
my view, I would associate myself with uh, Secretary Yellen uh, and several in the White House, is that like whichever whichever of those worries uh, keeps you more up at night, the the answer is the same, which is to push out the productive potential, the genuine productive potential of the country through a set of backbone infrastructure investments that's not just about the IRA, right? It's about chips and science. It's about the bipartisan infrastructure law and uh, that that will um, uh, create uh, genuine um, sources of um, productive capacity and um, supply uh, that can uh, push back on the kind of inflationary pressures that we have seen, uh, point one, point two. Um, I, I think that uh, a lot of these um, new jobs that are currently created uh, will be taxpayers, and we will see, uh, you know, some some relief off of the the, the kind of needs for a lot of um, uh, you know social services that uh, you know often are not as factored in as I would like them to be in some of the CBO estimates. Um, to, which is a way of saying if Republicans are fond of dynamic scoring for um, tax purposes, I'm a fan of dynamic scoring for um, the, the GDP boom and the, the ways in which that will contribute longer term back into the, the fiscal purse. But I do think where this gets really quite real is uh, around the need for um, genuine, no kidding, workforce development and quite fast when you look at the it, what we're doing right now, we've never tried to do, is, which is build entire supply chains at a time that are kind of you know multi-step and in, and in, in vertical integration, and um, that's just going to put a lot of stresses on the, the the workforce. And I think we, as um, probably as a society, is acutely certainly in the U.S. has just never been foot forward on worker training, and um, and that will be one of the biggest sources of um, inflation in the near term. Thank you. There are perhaps a question by Suman uh, on the efficiency yes. uh, dimension yes. of the carbon. Budget. I can also say something about the Plan B of uh, for Philippe, if you don't mind. Is uh, I mean, uh, right? Uh, it's short. Uh, very short. Uh, I mean, um, the risks are just very high. Geoengineering. We don't. We understand that you know a pinatubo can put. Uh, sulfur oxide into the air and that you can uh, somehow cool the planet temporarily with that, uh, but we don't know what the risks are in terms of what it needs to weather patterns and whether the monsoon, and there were lots of things that happened during Binatubo that, um, that were not necessarily um, uh, positive. Um, so second, uh, yes, the question, so, so what I did is very simple. Um, let me uh, no, no, take the numbers for, for India. So. Uh, right now, so assuming we have 500 gigatons left as a, as a world carbon budget and assuming that through NDCs or whatever mechanism, everybody goes to net zero. And also I'm assuming that there isn't much carbon extraction. You know, so we can, we can add a little bit if we think that uh, direct air carbon capture is going to be really big. But so I basically just asked the question, how are these 500 gigatons allocated in today's um, in today's uh, framework, the way that we are thinking. So the U.S. right now is uh, has a, uh, what, how much do, uh, is the, so, so China right now is about uh, 1.11 gigatons, so it has to somehow get down from 11 gigatons. And then what I said is, okay, this, it, these are the per year. So I'm, so the China is the uh, the share of China of all total emissions in uh, per year is about 30 percent. So I give 30 percent of the remaining carbon budget to China and divide that by the population. So that's that's all I did, right? So it's a you can you can divide the total carbon budget by everybody. Then you get about 60 to 70, and everybody gets the same. And then we see how we trade or what do we do. But if I do what we are, have essentially agreed, everybody goes to net zero from where they happen to be right now, then those who are ex emitting a lot right now get more. That's, that's the, simple, the simple mechanism here. So for India, which is now emitting two tons per year, it gets 5% of the remaining total carbon, uh, carbon budget, and that's per person about 20, uh, uh, 20 tons uh, per person. So that, that's all I did in order to illustrate how, uh, how unequal, really, uh, we are thinking about the transition. Yeah, please. 
And, and sorry, I should have mentioned, I think the most important point to place to start in, in your question is uh, this point of a counterfactual. So uh, one of my slides, I, I laid out the projected budgetary impacts of uh, uh, insufficient solutions on climate uh, out to 2050. Uh, OMB ran these numbers, they put them out about a month ago, and they basically find that you're looking at $2 trillion a year in um, uh, f less revenue coming into uh, you know, the, the US uh, public purse, and so it's kind of like we can pay two trillion now, all in, uh, which is roughly the you know Goldman Sachs estimate of the IRA, or we can pay two trillion dollars a year every year um, if we don't do anything. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me go back to the list of questions. I have many. We have uh, five minutes in principle. We let's say we take ten, uh, but questions sh should be extremely short. Um, so I have uh, this question here, yeah. John? No, no, you want to do this? Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm just drawing up my, my list. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Michael Grubb from UCL, Professor of uh, Climate Change in London. Um, the session is about sort of the, the, the macroeconomics of rapid transition, effectively. And one thing is, I think we're going to need a much better understanding of the relationship of finance and the electricity sector. You look at the scenarios, you're investing more than a trillion dollars a year globally, and the great majority of that is in the power sector. It's pretty much a trebling of the investment rate. Um, the electricity sector is central for many reasons. But one feature that's really not been figured at all is its nature and relationship to fossil fuels. When you look at the crisis that hit last year, people focus directly on gas. More than half of it now is electricity, and it is a highly volatile market because it's basically driven at the margin, marginal cost pricing by the fossil fuels required to keep the lights on. That cost went up to the roof. Government subsidized hugely, close to a... $800 billion, and yet as renewables come in more strongly, you'll have more periods when the price crashes to zero or even negative. So the volatility of the electricity sector, I think, is going to be an absolutely fundamental thing to understand in this transition and how to manage it. I just Thank wondered if any of the yeah. models look Thank good. you. John? Uh, no, first on Christian. So, of course, what you should be worried about is extreme events. But, but we also know, to the best of our knowledge, uh, the frequency of, free, of extreme events like heat waves is linear in, in the global mean temperature. So it's going to be kind of a smooth increase in that frequency. Of course, you should uh, uh, take notice of that. Uh, but it, it seems to be hard to come around the conclusion that even though we should be worried about climate change, uh, the, the worry should not be that you will be unable to control inflation because of, of climate change, at least in the coming decades. Uh, I would like to comment also on, on Jean's initial point on, on uh, the prices, and you said that we, there is a kind of a big range in what prices are required. Uh, I showed that uh, going from a situation where lots of fossil fuel is subsidized to a situation where we have a 20 uh, dollar price on emission, that's going to make a big difference. I, I did not say that that's sufficient to reach, for example, the Paris target. Uh, so, so there, if we want to do that, I think we probably uh, agree that we would need uh, a price on carbon in the order of maybe what we see in Europe now, like $100 per ton. Uh, but I think there is, we agree, lots of us, that that's not going to have a large cost uh, uh, I, I do think it's going to be a cost. Uh, we, we uh, uh, last year, or two years ago, we had a paper in JP where we actually estimated on US data the consequences of uh, price increases on, on fossil fuels leading to more technical change there, where the cost is that you divert uh, uh, R&D from, from increasing labor and capital productivity. And we find that. But it's not a very steep trade-off. Uh, so, so I think the costs uh, are uh, likely to be small, and the policy uh, uh, implications of verifying that, I think, are very large. So I think there is where we should focus. Thank you for the clarification. Last question is Pierre. 
sorry, it's actually more more of a comment, two comments. Uh, on, on monetary policy, I think the big unknown and the, the, the most important parameter is R star more than inflation. Uh, I mean, are real interest rates going to go up because we invest more? Um, and, and if so, well, you know, in theory, we don't even control our stuff. Uh, on on, on the, um, the cost of the transition, when, when you measure the cost, uh, you have a big issue about what's the reference. Is your reference a time when gas prices were at 50 or 20? The, the oil price is at 140 per dollar uh, per barrel or uh, 80. And of course, it makes a big difference. So what I try to um, show in my, my presentation is that compared to episodes when we had high energy cost, probably the cost of the transition is going to be relatively small, but it's still going to be more expensive than gas at 20 euro and coal at 15. Um, and when you have technologies that have a positive payback, like some renewables now that are competitive, um, so that you would save compared to some brown technologies, at least for some green ones, the, do you compensate for the negative uh, in computing the cost, or you say that would have been invested anyway, even without a climate objective, because the technology is cheaper. So, I mean, there are many discussions on how you, you compute the cost. Uh, what's the reference? Thank you. <laughs> um, can I uh, get back to the, the panel, perhaps in uh, starting with Bea and ending with Jennifer? Um, pick up whichever question you feel appropriate, perhaps our star. Uh, well, I, I, I think I cannot disagree with uh, with her, which I see those also more as comments. I, um, I think what the, the very uh, valid point that you were making about the estimates of, uh, of carbon taxes being what quite, uh, the range is quite uh, large, but there seems to be a, uh, a sort of a, a consensus that in order to be sufficient, we are probably talking more about 200 or more in terms of, uh, of uh, CO2 per ton. So in Europe, we are now at around 100, and uh, there is, a, there is a, a good possibility that it's going further up. Um, it doesn't, uh, we also all probably agree that the chances that the rest of the world implements carbon taxes of that size is rather small. And in fact, in the, in the study that I did not, uh, that I sort of flew over with, that the IMF did now for this, for this um, uh, wheel, they suggest that the necessary carbon taxes uh, are actually different by region, depending on the elasticities, on, uh, on how, how easily uh, and elastically uh, uh, emissions respond, and they can mitigate. Uh, but you still, we're talking about carbon taxes that are way, uh, way above anything that is very likely to happen uh, in the near future. So that's, in my, I mean, if, if I have to go back to that, um, that's why we have the two or more instrument discussion. Um, it's not necessarily because we don't understand what the first best is. And I do also think that Europe is the closest by far to the first best, but the rest of the world is not going to follow. And, uh, and Europe only has 8% of the total emissions. So we need to have solutions for the rest. Thank you. Christian? Yes. Um, just to say that, 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 that I, I agree with these comments I, uh, that, that were made, uh, both on this controlling inflation aspect and also the impact that on R square that we have, uh, R star that we have to, uh, to look at. I wanted to just um, add something to what Beatrice said, because that very, uh, um, resonated with me, these distributional um, effects that we have, that we have across the world, that we have also within Europe and that we have within countries. And I, I also think to think about the social impact that namely poor households most likely are more, more hit by climate change than, than richer households. And that we have to also think about the distributional um, effects of, of climate change and climate action also in terms of regions, I think is something um, that we have to bear in mind uh, when we design also climate action. Thank you, Jennifer. Sure, and um, maybe uh, connecting Beatrice's last point that uh, Europe has designed uh, the 
as close as anyone has come to a first best solution and the rest of the world will not follow uh, with, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the gentleman's name, name uh, making the point about $20 a, a ton global fee being uh, woefully insufficient. Um, both seem very um, manifestly correct to me and the question is what then should we do? Um, I think that argues for uh, focusing, you know, if, if you if the point is to try to, you know, not just evangelize a European ETS uh, because it will run headfirst into political walls, not just in the U.S. but uh, globally, uh, but to build something that is load bearing uh, multilaterally, I think you have to focus on the ends rather than the means. Which is to say, an ETS has worked pretty well for Europe. That's great for Europe. Uh, but uh, if we can figure out a, a way of, of um, focus, uh, you know, measuring what matters, which is at the end of the day emissions reduction, uh, and not care as much about the means that every country takes to get to those ends. Uh, I think that's that's a much sturdier uh, multilateral foundation from which to build. Um, and uh, I think one co-benefit of that is that at least when you look at where this might head in the US, uh, I would look to the, the bill that has bipartisan momentum behind it for a US carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, one benefit is that you can actually set the, the kind of price uh, at roughly what, what we're talking about, carbon costing, whether it's 150 or 185 from the nature study, uh, and then you don't have to push that rock up a very steep political hill of uh, figuring out ways to get it from 20 or even 100 to where we actually need to see it. And the, 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 the rejoinder seems to be, well, if, if the US goes this route, then what's to stop everyone else from doing it too? I think the answer is they should. And uh, this is a way of cleaning up one, one another's like dirtiest actors uh, while uh, still creating a mechanism for yourself to ratchet down the level of emissions that would uh, catch a, a, a producer in its crosshairs over time. Um, so uh, I, I'll leave it at that, but both good, good, good points. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure the discussion will uh, continue, uh, especially with the next session. Uh, and apologies for all those who could not ask their question. I've been uh, a lousy chairperson.
the Eric M. Zolt Chair in Tax Law and Policy at the University of California, Los Angeles, and she is also a non-resident fellow at Peterson. And Chad Bowne is also a non, uh, he's a very much resident of, <laughs> of, um, uh, I was, of Peterson. He holds the Reginald Jones Senior Fellow since uh, March 2018. Uh, following uh, Kim's presentation, we also have a paper by Ryan Hilde Vögelers, who is professor at the Katholieke Universiteit Leuven in Belgium, and is, she's also a non-resident uh, senior fellow. And we have two presenters also from Peterson, so this is a full Peterson panel. Uh, by Maurice Obstfield, who is Professor of Economics and former Chair of the Department of Economics, uh, University of California, Berkeley, a non-resident fellow here at Peterson, and Jeremy Settelmeyer, who is Director at Bruegel, but formerly Peterson as well. So all Peterson people here today. I will first give the floor to, to Kim, who will present, uh, but uh, Shad is also in the room to ask the questions later, if you have nasty questions. The good questions goes to Kim. So it's such a pleasure to be here for these two days with you all, and it's, I've learned a lot, and I'm, I'm looking forward very much to the conversation around this paper. Um, this is my 10th month, uh, by my calculations, as a Peterson uh, non-resident uh, fellow, and one of the great joys is events like this, and another great joy is the chance to finally write a paper with Chad, whose work I've, I've long respected. So uh, save all your hardest questions for him. Um, so this is a quick roadmap of where we're going, but the basic argument is that we're in a bad equilibrium that could be better, um, and that the main actors that we need to bring together to get to the better equilibrium are the United States, the European Union, and, and China. Um, and I'm going to start by sort of describing some of the trade frictions in the bad equilibrium, but also sort of suggest a path forward that's based around reciprocity, or the idea that there are things that can... Um, uh, be changed within the World Trading Organization rules, but that will begin with sort of an agreement by these three parties um, that, that could be mutually beneficial. Why these three parties? Well, they're obviously very large, important jurisdictions that comprise about three-fifths of the world economy, and they also account for about half of global emissions, slightly above half if you look at carbon, slightly below half if you look at greenhouse gases. Um, we're under no illusion that this is all of the problem. There's obviously another half of the global emissions that aren't these three. And in fact, 17 out of the top 20 aren't uh, these three jurisdictions. Uh, but we do think it's going to be difficult to get to resolution of some of the vexing climate and trade issues without bringing these three along. Um, and so that's uh, the idea. We're also under no illusion that this is going to be super easy. Um, but we do think there's some interesting steps forward that would be helpful. Um, I don't need to tell this audience that uh, there are asymmetric climate policy choices in the world. I, I agree with the characterization of, of many that Europe has, has done the best um, in terms of thinking about uh, climate policy in this area, in part because they are willing to rely in part on cost-imposing policies. And you can see uh, the European uh, Union uh, as a whole, their ETS system, but also higher uh, carbon prices in, in places like Germany and France, or higher coverage at any rate. Um, all of these uh, key jurisdictions subsidize the European Union included, uh, but also China and uh, the United States, although the subsidies vary very much in terms of their mechanisms, right? Um, and pricing is used uh, to some extent in China and in some um, subnational um, US jurisdictions, but nowhere near as broadly as in, as in Europe. So this generates a situation where there are large policy spillovers. And uh, in a paper that I wrote with Catherine Wolfram, who's here today and will be on the next panel, we focus on, on two, um, the uh, emissions externality and the competitiveness spillovers. And so I think the emissions externality is, is this number one here. And it's the Im important insight that there will be free riding in part because this is a global externality. And so when countries do ambitious things, that helps them, but it also helps the rest of the world, and that means that there probably won't be enough ambition, right? So that's one key problem. A second key um, policy spillover is around competitiveness, and this, uh, the part that Catherine and I focused on was kind of a combination of two and five, which is sort of the notion that if um, one jurisdiction is pricing 
and imagine you're uh, producing chemicals in, in Europe, for instance. You might have face pricing in terms of the chemicals production. The, the inputs into this energy intensive production will also be more expensive. And so if you're a chemicals um, you know, company, you will face a disadvantage when you're comparing yourself to competitors in the United States where carbon isn't priced and where, in fact, electricity might be subsidized through uh, things like IRA. Right? And when you have this diversity of policy approaches where there's some jurisdictions imposing costs and some uh, reducing costs, right, you end up with competitiveness spillover um, that you can address with something like a carbon border adjustment. But we should be aware that no single tool, whether it's a carbon border adjustment or a climate club, is going to handle both of these types of spillovers. So as an example, um, if, if Europe does a carbon border adjustment Right, uh, the United States might say, oh, we should be in that too, because never what matters. Uh, but we need to be aware that, that if the US also just put on the tariff without the price, right, that that's going to do nothing for that um, competitiveness spillover, right? Similarly, if the two, um, you know, uh, just do the uh, carbon border adjustment and the US doesn't, right, that's not gonna do anything about the emissions externality spillover. So the ambitious countries you know, we'll, we'll still worry that they can't handle that with that one tool. Um, there are other spillovers here too. The administration um, has liked to talk a lot about these learning and scale spillovers, and we saw some slides on that in the last panel, but this is important, right? If, if you have learning like we see in the case of uh, the uh, reductions in cost in solar over the past few decades, that benefits the entire world's transition. Uh, that's helpful. Um, there are also important upstream effects. Um, so if we look at the critical minerals case, right, whether you're subsidizing or whether you're um, pricing carbon, and both are going to drive up demand for batteries um, and the components in batteries, right? And so if you're uh, another country that wants to do your transition in a way that uses batteries, you're going to find those more expensive because of those policies. On the other hand, if you're a lithium producing country, you're going to find that a favorable um, short run effect. But these spillovers are important to recognize and they have caused a fair amount of friction. Um, so I'm gonna turn next to the friction and some of the responses that we've seen. This one slide could really take um, the full 20 minutes, so I'm gonna try to just keep it brief. Um, I'll talk first about unilateral responses. The European Union has responded to the US Inflation Reduction Act with both some praise, right? It's nice to see uh, the US back taking action with respect to emissions, and, and that is, is helpful, but also some concern, right, that some of this subsidization is going to come in a zero-sum way at the expense of European industries that have already been kind of uh, uh, built around, you know, the assumption that, that they wouldn't be facing that kind of competition. And so this has suggested some policy shifts. Um, including some proposals to sort of roll back some of the cost imposition on energy intensive industries uh, or to move towards more aggressive subsidization, which gets in the way of some of the state aid objectives. And we, we go through that some in the paper that's, that's still coming that you uh, well, haven't seen yet, but you will see. Um, the US response has been uh, somewhat um, conciliatory to, to trading partners in part because uh, you know the, the, their concerns are real, um, and some of the implementation has actually helped mitigate some of these concerns. I haven't talked yet about the domestic content provisions, but there, there are domestic content provisions in addition to subsidies that sort of put the thumb on the scale for U.S. Uh, production. Um, in the case of electric vehicles, there's actually a fairly straightforward workaround that's baked right into the legislation and didn't even require um, particularly creative implementation which is that if it's a commercial vehicle, uh, all of these strings don't attach to the tax credits. Um, and so in the case of leased cars, which have historically been a really important part, as you can see in this diagram from Chad's recent paper, um, uh, you know, uh, leased vehicles are a big part of the electric vehicle tax credit market. Those are also becoming more important again, in part because they aren't facing the same domestic content restrictions that we see in some of the other areas. Right, so there has been uh, U.S. responses. I don't think the U.S. unilateral changes are over, right? I, I think that this is going to be an area in the future that will continue to face uh, rethinking in part because of these higher budgetary costs, but, you know, there, there, there may be some battles down the road. There's also a host of bilateral um, efforts, right? So we could take each pair of these three um, key jurisdictions and look at their 
interactions with each other. In the case of the US and EU, there's a work towards a mini agreement on critical minerals um, and, and that would give them access to some of the same credits. There's talk of this green steel arrangement, although it's a little difficult to see what's in there. Um, there's proposals by others, including uh, one by Catherine and Luis and I, to enhance cooperation around methane, which actually might be kind of an interesting area to, to focus on greater alignment because there's a price involved in the IRA legislation that backs up regulation that's similar to the European approach, right? And so you might be able to build muscle for more aligned policy in, in that respect. If you look at the US and China and the EU and China, they too have their sources of, of uh, frictions and compromises, right? Um, in the case of uh, China and the EU, China has uh, complained about the European Union's plan for carbon border adjustment, and they're also concerned, of course, with export restrictions and investment screening and some of the other recent um, trade disputes, um, trade-related disputes. In the case of US and China, you know, there's this big controversy about whether this is gonna be de-risking or decoupling, or what does the evolution of this, this look like, right? Um, what we're suggesting going forward is that uh, by focusing on these three jurisdictions and thinking about reforms to the trade rules, you could actually get to a situation that's, that's less fraught and it's more collaborative where each of the jurisdictions could have important things uh, to get from, from a form of these WTO rules. So first, let's talk about the principles that we put forward for organizing this thought. And then, then we're gonna go through three types of WTO rules, those affecting subsidies, those affecting export restrictions, and those affecting border measures, right? And all three of those taken together, if you think about changing the rules a bit, right, will have something that can offer that group of three together. But if you separate them and look at them one at, one at a time, or if you look at each bilateral arrangement one at a time, it's a little harder to get to uh, resolution. So the key principle here is that you know, climate change is the paramount priority, um, but that it's not necessarily the case that trade friction is gonna serve that, right? If, if we can find ways to reduce and ease this trade restriction, that might in fact deliver better climate results as well as better trade results over time. And that the value of a rules-based system is, is in fact that you can have your cake and eat it too somewhat in this extent, but not have to sort of sacrifice uh, a trade, you know, in honor of climate, right? So let's look at three examples of this um, and, and new guardrails that might help ease these um, concerns. So take, for instance, the current subsidy rules in the WTO. It, it's very clear that there's two types of subsidies that are prohibited, right? Those that rely on domestic content and those that rely on export. Right, so Chad and I suggest that those are very reasonable prohibitions and that we wanna keep those and reject and dismantle any national content provisions that, that are present. But at the same time, um, other subsidies are acknowledged um, as feasible in the context of WTO rules, but actionable in the sense that if your injury is hurt by the subsidies of another country, you can go to the WTO and, and explain that injury and get proportionate right to remedy that. This is an important thing to acknowledge too because it seems quite clear to us and that you know, countries will, will want to subsidize. That's not gonna go away and they've been doing that for a long time. So the key is to have the subsidies occur in a context that um, where the remedies are both expected and where they themselves come with guardrails, right? So in the case of, um, you know, recent history, we've often seen these remedies taken kind of to the street outside of the WTO, and that can lead to sort of escalation and uh, trade disputes, right? And, and it'd be better to have this much more regularized, right? So that, so that when countries subsidize, they would come with the expectation that, of course, other countries may want to, to remedy uh, should their industries be, be hurt by those subsidies down the road, right? And I think there are some, some current risks um, and the, the United States government has fully, hasn't fully understood, you know, having been the one complaining about other country subsidies for a long time, that they will be subject to the same com complaints, uh, you know, should their subsidies get very large in the context of the Inflation Reduction Act, right? So um, the idea here for the guardrails is that we'd expect other countries to respond, but they, they would respond with evidence and with sunsets and with 
you know, less fear of capture. Um, turning to border measures, right? The, the standard restrictions through the WTO are that border measures should be subject to most favored nations, so that if you levy a tariff on another country's products, you, you know, you, you apply that same tariff on a most favored nation basis to all WTO members, and that goods should be treated with national treatment, so once it makes it over the border, right, you're not discriminating among products. There's some concerns that the EU CBAM would be challenged on these grounds. I, I think on most favored nation, the argument would be something like, well, you're not treating all of the products the same because the ones with more carbon are being treated differently. Um, you know, one could make the argument, which I think is very sound, that, well, actually, you know, this is a domestic regulation, the ETS, right, and we're simply applying this to other countries as well, right, so that when they uh, send products to the European Union, they also face this, the same treatment, right, um, and I think that that, you know, is a very defensible argument. Um, there's also concerns about the non-discrimination angle, but of course, if, if Europe is phasing out their free allocations, which is uh, the way that they subsidize firms as they're adjusting to this uh, this ETS system, right, if they phase those out as they're putting in the tariffs, right, then there isn't a discrimination problem because you're creating a level playing field with respect to all the products that are in Europe, right? So despite the fact that, you know, this can be very um, WTO consistent, um, other countries have made it clear that they view this as sort of protectionism in disguise, with most recently China just com uh, complaining about it quite, quite recently in the news today. So I think the reform to suggest here is that these types of EU um, carefully structured CBAMs would be, would receive a green light, but we'd make an explicit link between having a CBAM and having it be non-discriminatory, right? So that there isn't the temptation to turn to this border adjustment only version, which I think it really doesn't address the competitiveness differentials or spillovers between those countries. Right, um, and so making that explicit, and you know, I think another big step here is to move toward greater policy alignment, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that on, on the final slide. Um, a final area here is the export restriction rules. If you look at the current WTO rules, they have very few limits in a way here. You're allowed to have an export tax, that's not constitutional in the United States, but it is in many countries. Um, there's limits on the use of quantitative restrictions, but there's also this language that says if it's an essential good, you can restrict exports, right? Um, since essential good isn't particularly clearly defined, that does leave a lot of room for export restrictions, and I think that creates a lot of risk to the, to the world trading system and to uh, you know, a peaceful, uh, low friction solution to some of these problems because countries anticipate that trade can be weaponized and then are more likely to subsidize or do things like discriminate, discriminate among products in part out of that fear. So if you look at one of the big motives for the, the national content provisions in IRA, it was this concern that otherwise China would have too much power and too much ability to you know, um, control the, the transition economy as a whole, right? So the reform here is to say, okay, if we can bring China to the table and say, okay, you agree not to uh, restrict exports on climate-related goods, and in fact, we all agree not to restrict exports on, on climate-related goods, that makes it easier to then say to the other countries, okay, you're gonna take into account other countries when you're doing your subsidies, you're not gonna do domestic content, you're not gonna do discriminatory things, but you, you can rest assured that you'll still have access to these really important climate-related transition goods. Now, if you see these three guardrails together, right, I think they're much more effective as a package than they would be by themselves, right? Um, the countries that subsidize can expect, you know, a, a more routinized but, but limited responses to that. Countries that want to do a CBAM can have that greenlit but subject to the restriction that it really is leveling the playing field. And export restrictions can be made um, more rare, hopefully, or non-existent in a way that would ultimately make some of the disputes here less. Um, I'm not gonna say a lot about dispute settlement, except for that I think a prerequisite to being able to reform that is really to be able to handle some of these other issues, right? At present, this is dysfunctional. 
in the past it's been slow, um, but, it, but it's helpful. Um, but I think in order for a dispute settlement to be you know, fully reformed, you need the United States at the table too, which means you know, reconciling some of these other things. Okay, just a few, this is my last slide, just a couple concluding thoughts here. Um, one is what about the rest of the world? It's clearly extremely important to, to bring them along. We've started with these three jurisdictions because we see them at kind of like the heart of these um, trade and climate disputes. But the hope is if you could get um, a smoother relationship between those three that that could ultimately encourage as a stepping stone reforms to the WTO um, and better you know, climate cooperation. And I think really two things that this room might think about um, in terms of this path towards greater climate cooperation is how do we get to better policy alignment, which makes all of this much easier, right? If, if everybody were doing the European approach, for instance, it's, then we can implement that nice IMF paper and it's like, okay, 75, 50, 25, that makes a huge difference in the path of, of future carbon emissions in a fiscally sustainable way. It's a lot easier to do if, there, if there's greater policy alignment. So what are the carrots and sticks that can move us toward greater policy alignment? It's possible that trade can be both a carrot and a stick here, right? That CVAMs and climate clubs are much more possible when the policies are aligned and can create incentives that lead to more climate cooperation. Um, and that trade liberalization can also be helpful here in market access, right? Keeping open the access to the transition goods, keeping open the free flow of trade and ideas and services, you know, is, is gonna be crucial to this transition as well. Right, so I think in terms of, of lessons from yesterday, I think, and, and today, we should think about how to get towards that more aligned output, because I think that does make it much easier to have, you know, a solution to this really vexing global collective action problem. Thank you very much for this, Kim. Um, and save your questions for a little bit later, because we will also hear the presentation from Ryan Hilde uh, and your, your paper, and then we'll do the commenting on, on both at the same time. You have actually captured all the buzzwords in Brussels in one single title. Innovation for open, strategic, autonomy, clean energy, industrial policy. Congratulations <laughs> for that. And then we will have Jeremy and um, Maurice commenting both of the papers, I think, so we have a joint discussion. Yep, indeed, that was uh, the trick. But the major word is innovation uh, here because that's actually the angle that I want to take and it's somewhat different from, but still very, in the, very much in the same line here. So it's really trying to figure out where we are um, in, in, in respect to innovation rather than trade policy here uh, and see how we can actually move that uh, agenda further. Um, so the reason why we want to focus on, on industrial policy aspect and how innovation can actually help for that is because um, this uh, industrial policy will be very important to make the transformation uh, from, from uh, green uh, to, to green here in a way that there are enough winners to compensate for the losers here. That, so that's the industrial policy angle here. But the big challenge here is to really reconcile uh, multi-dimensional objectives here. So we want to go for decarbonization, we want to go for competitiveness, and there is also increasingly um, the discussion of we also want security of supply, and particularly like of the, the energy component out of this uh, here, and that gets translated in this sovereignty, uh, strategic autonomy, uh, decoupling, de-risking, whatever that you, you want here. So it's these three um, dimensions that um, that are uh, present as an objective function here. And those are very challenging uh, to, to, re to reconcile here, particularly once they start uh, potentially uh, counteracting each other here. And so my major point is actually that if we bring in innovation in this, uh, in this industrial policy, this green industrial policy, then this will actually make it easier to reconcile these uh, three uh, aspects uh, here. Um, but, that will not come easily here, so it doesn't come uh, from itself here. That can, innovation can only play that role of reconciling if it's also properly guided by policy uh, here. So the innovation machine can be powerful here, but it needs to be steered in the right direction. And what we want to do is actually lay out the principles or at least some kind of principles in terms of how we should steer the innovation machine here in the right direction, check whether what we're currently having in terms of um, 
the performance of, of these uh, energy uh, innovations, uh, whether that fits with, with what we could have here, and draw from that possible recommendations here. Um, although, in general, we will be talking about green industrial policy, clean energy will be a very specific focus here, because that's also very pivotal in the whole transition here, uh, in terms of reducing emissions uh, here. But before I, I embark on, on show, making that case for innovations, and particularly innovations for clean energy, three fallacies to debunk, which were also raised a bit uh, yesterday here. First is the one that comes some degrowth here. Uh, the, the argument there is that we may not need new innovations here. It's, it's basically a change in consumption patterns that will basically do it here. I think that's a fallacy in the sense that it's not one or the other here. It's actually these two complement each other. Um, also for innovation, you need consumption patterns to change uh, in order for innovation to have the right uh, take up uh, here. Um, and vice versa, innovations can also make those uh, required changes in, 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 in behavior also way more easy, less costly uh, here, provided it's properly steered. Um, another um, fallacy is that we already have the necessary technologies and we don't need uh, innovation here. But there, um, and here I'm relying on the uh, International Energy Agency, um, it's very clear that um, with the existing technology that we have, we will not be able to, to, to get to the reach to, to reach our targets here, and particularly not fast enough and in the most effective uh, way uh, here. Um, some of the technologies, so there are only very few that are truly mature here. There are uh, Most of them are still in early or late stage uh, adoption and which still will need improvements uh, here. Um, and then there are still also, uh, never to, to forget something that the EEA also doesn't always look at, those ideas that still are, are completely in the heads of the, of, of, of the researchers here or in the lab here, that um, may still take quite a long time before they actually will be realized, but that could really be the next, the, the, the breakthroughs that we would need in the future uh, here. So that's why I do think we still need uh, the innovation machine to improve the existing ones here in order to buy us enough time to also be able to, to still capitalize on these uh, backstop technologies uh, here. And then a third fallacy is that um, uh, the innovation machine already will do its job anyway here. Uh, we just have to sit and, 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 and wait till these innovations come on the market uh, here. But that, uh, I think, is obviously clear here that we will need the steering of, 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 of the innovations here in order to get there. Um, one particular... Uh, element that I want to raise is that innovation will be important, not just only to get the technologies for decarbonization. Innovations and the innovation machine can also help to get to this resilience or this security uh, of supply here. And that's particularly, I think, very helpful in order to avoid that we have other more costly ways of dealing with these uh, resilience uh, requests here that would go more in, in terms of protectionism uh, here. Um, so the way in which innovations can help in building that resilience is to go for more uh, new methods for energy efficiency, new designs that will use less of these critical minerals uh, that, that will provide bottlenecks uh, here. Uh, reuse and recycling is, is, a, is a technology area that still needs quite a lot of development, but that really could also help a lot on, on resilience uh, here. Material substitutions, uh, particularly substituting those materials uh, that, that would be uh, key bottlenecks. And then I think also the development of modular production technologies that can switch between different um, materials and components much more easily so that you become less sensitive for, for critical components uh, here. Um, Okay, I hope I've convinced you uh, why you should listen to, <laughs> to to how to get the innovation machine working for green industrial policy here. But like it was also yesterday uh, raised, what makes it so spe special here? Is there anything we need to do different from what we usually do in terms of, of innovation policy? Um, and yes, we do, because there are some really specifics of clean technologies uh, that need to be taken into account. What was already mentioned several times is here, the fact that we have to, we're dealing here with several uh, uh, market failures here, so it's a knowledge externality, there is the environmental externality uh, on top of this, and it means that you need, really need to mix and coordinate uh, innovation policy instruments, that point has been made quite a lot. Another very important point is that uh, there is a lot of path dependencies and, and lock-ins, and I'm looking at, at Philippe here, um, and this holds particularly also very importantly for clean technologies, which means in order to avoid these path dependencies and, and uh, these um, network uh, stickiness uh, here, 
um, is very important for clean because also on top of uh, what's, what we usually see is many of these technologies really need a much longer lead time uh, of, of investments here. So that means you get stuck also very long into, uh, into, into certain pets. And that's not only the choice between uh, dirty and clean, but also even among the more cleaner, between the, the, the very clean and the, and the more hybrid clean here. So whatever choice that you make for a particular technology, even if that's not the most clean yet, gets you stuck into and you have to compensate for uh, making sure that then you don't um, uh, block the way or lock in the way for, the, for what's in the pipelines in terms of even uh, more uh, green outcomes here. So overall, that, that means that we need much more directionality than, than we typically have uh, here to combine this, uh, these different um, externalities and this path dependency here. Uh, on top of that, and we've also already discussed this morning, there's a lot of uncertainty here, both in terms of, of, of on the technology side, on the supply side, also in terms of the demand side here. Um, and that makes it also way more difficult because because of the directionality, we will need to make cho uh, choices here, but these choices occur with a lot of uncertainty. Uh, here's, uh, and the problem is if you make wrong choices, you get stuck, you have this, luck, this likelihood to get stuck in, 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 in a bad dependencies uh, here. Um, also very importantly is that in the end, um, whether we will make it or not, this transition is really up to whether the private sector is, is taking up these technologies in, and turn that into investments uh, for cleaner production here. So that means involvement of the private sector will be very important, making sure we incentivate that. Um, and the same also for civil society because it's the uptake of these technologies will be very important here. So because of all these uh, arguments, so it's really very important that we combine different instruments, that we uh, that, that uh, we, we are able to deal with uncertainties here. So that puts a lot of pressure on the governance of these policies uh, here. So there is a lot of potential risk for government uh, failure uh, here. And on top of that, there is also the longer term horizon that we need to take here. Um, and uh, government uh, policy choices very often have a short term window here. They don't want to take risks here. So there is a lot of, the, the, for me also, very important challenge for the whole green industrial policy making innovation based is this governance uh, challenge uh, here. So nevertheless, I think we have no choice but to, to try. Um, uh, and try to avoid as much as possible these uh, these uh, potential government failures uh, here. Um, and I do think that we can use some principles from an for an innovation-based clean tech industrial policy from a more new uh, industrial policy perspective, uh, as for instance, um, also laid out by, by Roderick. Uh, so industrial policy is not just about, okay, let's pick winners uh, and let's go for competitiveness here. So he sees actually within a new industrial policy perspective, we have to deal with these broader multidimensional objectives, not purely picking winners for competitiveness, and also seeing the policy making really as a process of what he calls institutionalized public-private partnerships, collaboration, uh, where what's really very important is that you coordinate among different policy instruments, among different uh, stakeholders here along the whole value chain, uh, here also involving civil society um, because they need to take up these, these um, uh, in, in innovations too here. Uh, making choices, but making choices within a, within a technology portfolio perspective uh, here. So not looking at individual choices, but really seeing the whole portfolio perspective on this. And that also allows you to take more risk uh, within your portfolio here. So really balancing the very early stage, highly risk type of, of projects versus the more um, established, more mature, uh, so that you can actually balance uh, these risks uh, way better here. Um, going for enough uh, risk also by policy experimentation uh, here. So really seeing also the innovative angle in policy making here, we need to really experiment, but experimenting in a scientific uh, sound fashion here. So that means try new things, even if we don't know whether they will work or not here, but be, be sure that you evaluate very quickly uh, whether this will work or not and adjust uh, or not. Also very important is, and that's also why you need public-private partnerships, is to deal with the information challenges uh, here so you also need to make sure that the information pieces that are available here, that they are coordinated and that people have the incentives to contribute to that innovation and that you also jointly learn and jointly learn uh, fast 
uh, as well here. So monitoring and evaluation will also be very important of that uh, um, uh, experimentation part of this uh, here. So overall, I think it is possible uh, to try to minimize the government failures as much as possible here and at least do better than, than, than um, what uh, the, the market left on, on its own would do here. But I think it's very clear that this really requires a very strong policy government governance uh, here. It's not easy. Um, so let's have a look and see what we or whether we already have this or, or not here. So very quickly, uh, because I don't have the time. So in the paper, uh, I looked at the performance of the clean energy innovation machine. I looked at clean tech pat patents, scientific publications, corporate investments in R&D, um, and, de and deployment green bonds, venture capital investments, particularly uh, here across time, across countries, and also across clean tech uh, areas uh, here. Won't go into the details. Uh, but I think the overall con conclusion is that uh, the innovation machine is working. It's not that it's not present here on clean tech, but at a speed below its, its potential here. It's a high variance across countries here. Fast rise of China is very clear um, in all the different dimensions here. The EU has a relatively strong and stable position here already from its early uh, from early on. And the US actually relatively underperforming. It's not really not it's not there, but Given its very strong innovation uh, capacity in other areas like in digital, it's, it's much less so in, in, in clean tech uh, here. Um, and of course, these different uh, choices uh, and, and performance relate to, to, to different givens in terms of uh, innovation capacity strength or other advantages uh, here, but also relate very strongly to green innovation policy choices that are different here. So very quickly, if you look at, uh, and we've already discussed this quite substantially, you have the carbon price, but you also have the deployment targets, and then uh, have the subsidies uh, here. And you see huge uh, variance here with the EU, very strong in carbon pricing, although not covering everything, but with the latest um, um, revisions of this will also increase the, the uptake of this. With the US, not on carbon pricing, also not in, in terms of, of targets uh, here. Um, and you see some areas are way more um, influenced by targets, such as biofuels here, and you also see that in, in, in the uptake of these technologies here. But overall, so the US is, is low on that. The EU and China are much better in terms of targets. And then if you look at subsidies, the total public uh, R&D support here, uh, first important point is that actually relatively small uh, government R&D support here, certainly for clean energy, certainly compared to other areas uh, here. Uh, so it's it's increasing, but very slowly here. Um, and again, uh, so the EU and, and China are the growing areas here, where the US is pretty stable um, in, in that respect. Um, but of course, there are the recent uh, trends in this here, and I won't go into too much detail because I'm, I'm going to, <laughs> to run out of time here. So uh, the US is really picking up with the IRA and uh, uh, also the investment and infrastructure and job uh, acts here, which was really boosting in terms of public R&D spending, not in terms of carbon pricing, but in terms of public R&D spending uh, here. Also, some of its strength is that it has a few very important components, like the Department of Energy, which is the, the federal agency that really coordinates the, these, uh, these investments in uh, R&D for clean uh, energy uh, here, where initially was quite a lot of emphasis on, on the early stages here with Office of Science uh, funding. Um, providing really the support for the large national laboratories, which have been pretty successful to deliver some of the new uh, ideas uh, here. Also important to note is the ARPA-E, uh, which is the sister of, of DARPA uh, here, which although it gets very small amount of the total budget uh, here, it's still very specific in, in the sense that it also nurturing really new strategic energy technologies that are too risky for the private sector, but uh, would actually be potential breakthroughs in the future here. And then finally, also new uh, is the Office of Clean Energy Demonstration, which is, again, very small amount of money here, but still, all, uh, again, signals this new uh, approach to partner with the private sector to get into demonstration projects here. So it's a reflection of this public-private partnership here. Uh, so the IRA, of course, provided massive um, um, subsidies uh, here. Not so much in terms of for R&D here, it was mostly on, on, on deployment here, and also this low content requirement uh, here, but that um, was uh, already discussed before. So overall, I think you, you could argue that the, the EU, sorry, the US is catching up in terms of support for clean tech uh, R&D here. 
Uh, it has some strengths uh, here that you can exploit, but I think the major comment for me is, first of all, in terms of the policy governance, linking all these different parts of, of, of the uh, programs that it actually has here, um, and also the longer-term commitment, which is very important uh, here. So those are still two important weaknesses here. If I look at the EU, but I'm running completely out of time here, uh, so there, most of the funding is in, in, in the hands of the member states. Um, there are some few projects at the EU level, and they go very much in this direction of public-private uh, partnerships uh, here, um, with the alliance batteries, of battery alliance, for instance, and the IPCASE uh, with the hydrogen here connecting really across. Um, so that uh, definitely is, 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 is there and goes in the right uh, direction here, and it also has have this mix of policy instruments, regulation, carbon pricing, and then a good way of, of, of spending at the EU uh, level here. But still missing is, so a lot of bits and pieces here, but they're not really integrated uh, with, with the systemic uh, pol um, governance of all these different instruments uh, here. And then you have the Net Zero Industry Act, which was a reaction to the IRA. Again, don't have much uh, time to discuss on this here, but that was really picking certain selected uh, Net Zero technologies and projects here, so it's very much, again, selecting uh, here. Um, for those, um, they, they really have to have a target in sense of the 40% target uh, that they all have uh, to, to reach this. Uh, and the 40% means manufacturing locally over uh, deployment here. So there isn't really a local content requirement here, but it comes pretty close uh, to that here. And the way in which uh, these, um, if they are selected, they get then priority status in terms of permitting, uh, and also uh, some favorable treatment in terms of public procurement here. Uh, but most of it uh, is still, I mean, this is, this is no extra EU money, money for this here. It's just extra support uh, here. So what we actually would, would argue for is that, um, that, we, that the, certainly the new trends uh, with the Net Zero Industry Act is completely ignoring the EU level uh, here, the EU scale and the EU project uh, uh, funding here. And we would like to see more of that. It's announced with the sovereignty fund here, but still within the current proposals, uh, the EU market is actually not so much um, uh, exploited here. And then finally, in terms of the global uh, coordination that we would need uh, here, uh, it's definitely clear where we need global coordination. It's very, there is not much going on at that level uh, here, despite the fact that there is a lot of bottom-up global cooperation uh, in the private sector here. It's the public sector that's completely uh, lagging behind uh, on this. Um, and what we would argue for is, is a, a very much in line, actually, with what, uh, with, with, uh, what uh, was mentioned before, kind of global uh, R&D platform, uh, but with the relevant players here for the R&D stages and the early R&D stages, because the, within the early R&D stages, there's much more room for global cooperation, for finding win-win situations here, since you're still far enough from, from commercialization uh, here. Um, and win-win are much more stable collaborative agreements here. Um, and to do that with the EU and the US, because those systems are already highly uh, connected uh, here, and then possibly scale that up uh, later uh, here. Uh, and that kind of platform could also deal with the common uh, common commons problem of uh, addressing the demand for technology that would be specific for uh, at the global level for less developed countries here. Jointly financing these kinds of programs uh, would definitely be something that this platform could also do here. But now I really already run out of time. I hope I've convinced you to look at the innovation machine uh, as a solution. <laughs> but that is challenging. Thanks. Okay, I'm just waiting for the slides. Long and variable lags. It's, I, I see it on my screen, but not on the, you can't see it, I can see it. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, <laughs> right, 
when you open the door, that makes the, that's where the switch is. Um, okay, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this has been a great conference, and these are two fantastic papers. Um, great. Uh, uh, they're related, though they have different emphases. Um, Chad and Kim focus on frictions owing to the very different US, EU, and Chinese approaches to carbon emissions reductions. Uh, a key, key message is that trade frictions may uh, undermine the um, search for global solutions, and they suggest that this trio commit to um, a rule-based approach to uh, cooperation, or at least to, to resolving the frictions inherent in their different approaches. Uh, Reinhilde focuses on EU and US industrial policies, but also with some attention to global coordination and global solutions and uh, she makes the case that existing methods of uh, 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 supporting research are to some degree insufficient or, or inefficient. And I think both messages need to be taken to heart. Okay, uh, let me underline with a chart a point that Kim made, which is that together the, the USA, the EU, and China, the focus of their paper, account for only about half of global challenges. These are 2021 numbers, these show 2019 numbers, but you get the message here. The rest of the world is, is, is accounting for about half of emissions, and unless we bring the rest of the world in, uh, we're not gonna solve the, uh, the climate problem. Most of these emissions from the rest of the world come from low and middle income countries. India is most notable, uh, with about 7.3% of global emissions, but other countries are notable as well. And so uh, we need to provide incentives, options, and capacity for this part of the world, the lower income world, to uh, address the climate crisis. And clearly China also has to be engaged in a constructive fashion. All of this is happening in an environment where uh, the major high income countries are looking to shift their supply chains, uh, which will have geopolitical as well as economic spillovers. The move in the US to uh, de-risk, if you want to put it in quotation marks, great. Uh, European open strategic autonomy. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, just-in-time supply chains were common. Uh, the pandemic risks suggested uh, just-in-case would be a good idea. and. Uh, uh, what is very much on the horizon now is just friends, <laughs> supply chains. Um, in perspective, more resilience certainly is needed in supply chains, uh, and the just-in-time and just friends approaches overlap to the extent that potential shocks are geopolitical. Uh, economic theory tells us that networks can be very fragile. Uh, even localized small shocks can destabilize entire systems. There's a great survey in the Annual Review of Economics by uh, Elliot and Golub on the current state of theory. And I think one important message is that resilience can't be fully decentralized via market forces. Um, individual nodes may lack sufficient incentive to invest in resilience uh, because they don't internalize necessarily the beneficial effects on others. In fact, another lesson of this literature is that more interconnection may be better for small shocks, but it may be worse for big shocks. To the extent that uh, the EU, the US are worried about big geopolitical shocks, or to the extent we worry about big pandemic shocks or big extreme weather shocks, there's possibly a trade-off between um, security versus efficiency from maintaining very intricate supply chains and from uh, uh, breaking them up. Um, the process through which we bolster resilience is not inconsequential for uh, where we are going and where we end up. Um, it's very easy to pursue beggar thy neighbor modes of boosting resilience. That will alienate key partners. Uh, and that includes hostile acts to maintain quote unquote leadership in technology areas, particularly green technology, uh, these actions risk foregoing uh, uh, the uh, 
international spillovers, beneficial spillovers from R&D, learning by doing, and innovation. Uh, flouting the WTO rules is threatening for uh, many potential partners, particularly smaller countries. And climate clubs, while on the upside, they may induce favorable policy developments with respect to climate pricing, may seriously backfire if poorer countries feel impoverished and penalized. Uh, remember that these countries are also custodians of the global commons. Think of the Brazilian Amazon. It's important to keep them on board. Uh, proposals like the US proposed fee on uh, carbon intensive imports are discriminatory, absent the US carbon price, and amount to barely disguised tariffs, which will have a negative effect on the global system. You know, ideally, as was uh, pointed out by Kim, we would, like, we would like countries to embrace similar carbon pricing models uh, with lower income nations supported by private and official foreign resource flows. Um, there's, a, there's a symbolism and substance of the social cost of carbon concept. If you pick the right social cost of carbon, uh, it deals not just with your domestic emission, emissions, but with the cost of emissions on foreign countries. So it's inherently a very cooperative concept. And this is precisely why um, uh, what uh, Jennifer Harris alluded to this morning, the Trump administration scaled down the, the uh, estimate of the SEC to basically take into account, and only minimally take into account, damages to the US not to the rest of the world. That was the whole premise of what they did. Um, uh, the paper by Chad and Kim is really masterful in analyzing the tensions from diverging, divergent approaches, uh, the Chinese emphasis on subsidization, the more price-based approach in the EU, and the US IRA with its Buy American provisions. Uh, I'll just mention that one silver lining is that at least these uh, approaches are going in the same direction to uh, um, uh, mitigate climate damages. And there is the possibility, uh, only a possibility, of a net virtuous uh, policy competition cycle, which uh, uh, Kim and uh, Catherine mentioned in their JEP paper. Uh, Jacob Kierkegaard, our Peterson colleague, has talked about this also. Um, there are huge political economy barriers to carbon pricing. Um, we've talked about some of this. Um, subsidization is clearly a path of least resistance. Uh, carrots are much easier to swallow than sticks. Uh, the US is a major roadblock. Uh, I agree with what was said this morning. Just ain't gonna happen. Uh, part of it is the exceptionally strong influence of fossil fuel interests through the US political process. And the EU uh, is not unique but it may be exceptionally well positioned because of the wariness of subsidies that could upset the single market that makes a tax on carbon more attractive. But there are also important fiscal costs of subsidization. Um, uh, and at some level, it's much easier to uh, do the fiscal offset to a carbon tax, which is to do uh, lump sum redistributions, and that may be valuable on political economy grounds, than to raise the taxes that, uh, that would offset, um, offset carbon subsidies. One great example is uh, Canada, which actually put in place a federal carbon price floor in 2019. Uh, I think what happened in Canada is indicative of why the US situation is much less optimistic. Uh, uh, conservatives in Canada basically ran the 2019 election uh, on uh, uh, criticism of the federal carbon charge. They lost that election. Several provinces contested this in court. Um, they lost. Uh, the right-wing premier of Ontario, Doug Ford, mandated that gas uh, uh, pumps uh, carry stickers. And you can see the sticker on the bottom there, highlighting the effects on gas prices of the federal carbon tax. There's also a counter sticker talking about the rebates that, uh, pe that people were getting. Uh, the Ontario Supreme Court ruled that the anti-carbon tax stickers were unconstitutional compulsory speech. And when you see this process, you ask, well, how would this play out in the United States? How would the post-Trump US court system uh, react? And uh, 
one has to be extremely pessimistic. Uh, the recent controversy over mifepristone is just the tip of a very big anti-regulatory uh, iceberg that is uh, gonna really prevent a lot of progress in the US on anything like a carbon tax. Um, uh, I wanna come back to something that um, Jim Stock, who was here yesterday, um, wrote, and that I agree with, and he says this mainly on political economy grounds, which is that the most important thing to focus on is the development of inexpensive fossil fuels that uh, households and businesses will want to adopt, that carbon pricing is necessary, uh, but it alone is insufficient, because the, the types of uh, carbon prices we we're talking about to really collect, correct the externality are, are probably too high. Uh, besides, Peguvian pricing doesn't deal with a number of issues that we've talked about uh, extensively yesterday, R&D and learning by doing externalities, network effects, critical mass scale effects, an area where open markets will certainly help. Uh, capital market imperfections are also very important. And one example that's important in this context, but only one, is the availability of developing country finance for uh, mitigation investments. So these are all areas where there are true externalities warranting government intervention, not the pecuniary externalities or spillovers uh, that are uh, the focus of the controversies over the uh, IRA and the, uh, the CBAM. This reinforces Reinhilde's messages, which I think are, are really important. Uh, the US is falling short. Um, EU innovation support is somewhat balkanized and could run at stronger speed. Uh, there should be an EU level subsidy regime for early stage research backed by fiscal resources. Uh, maybe Jeremy is going to go into this uh, since he co-authored a very nice paper recommending this. Um, Reinhilde mentions protectionist measures against the use of foreign superior technologies and support for reshoring. And I, I question whether this is really an efficient way to go. And I think of China's stance on foreign vaccines, which was not particularly useful. Uh, for the US, I worry going forward about the, the uh, permanence of the kind of approach the Biden administration has taken, even that approach, uh, the politics is gonna create investment uh, uncertainty, which is gonna be damaging and which is gonna slow the process. I think there's a, a larger analogy to the recent and continuing, let's not forget this, uh, vaccine challenge. Uh, the next pandemic is possibly not far away. Um, just as was the case with vaccines, we need to pursue many avenues toward lower cost energy, including long shots and the support of complementary sectors. And Chad has done a lot of great writing on that in the vaccine context. Uh, new technologies are gonna have to be spread and made available to poorer countries. And they will need help to upgrade energy infrastructure and to avoid carbon lock-in. Um, in general, I think we will lose if we try to impede China's innovation in this area in the interests of US supremacy, for example. Uh, on the right is a chart from uh, uh, Reinhilde's paper indicating something she mentioned, the sharp rise in China's um, innovation capacity. Uh, we shouldn't be holding back China in this area, and this is all the more reason for uh, less confrontation and more cooperation. So thank you very much. Uh, so I will face the challenge of the clicker now. But before I do, let me just uh, thank the organizers, uh, particularly Adam Posen and, and of course, Jean uh, for inviting me. It's a great honor. These are, they're working on it. These are two great papers. It's coming. But, but before I actually talk about these papers, let, let me just say how much I agree with and how, how much I admire what Maury just said. I mean, Maury has this uncanny ability of com combining nuance with edge and, and pointing sort of to, to where the weak bits of an argument are. 
And I'm very grateful to him, particularly for pointing to the perspective of the poorer countries, which tends to get lost in this whole debate of EU versus US versus China, just like uh, Beatrice did also uh, in the discussion. Okay, so um, uh, it's coming up. I can I can see this. Uh, it's just uh, it's just a bit uh, s uh, slow. So I, I, f I faced a tough uh, choice in, in my comments because it's really hard to do justice uh, to both papers. And so I think I focused on the uh, paper that has the, uh, I think, sort of the, the clearer immediate uh, implications for the debate between uh, the US and, uh, and the EU and industrial policy. And that's actually interestingly not the paper that is mainly about industrial policy. <laughs> which is Reinhilde and who I mainly uh, agree with, but it's the uh, clausing uh, and, and Chad uh, paper. So let me just say, I, I know my slides basically, but before why, why I think these are two great papers and I think also what, what these papers have in common. So these are basically essentially both survey papers, but survey papers that contain a lot of factual uh, content. And so in particularly in the case of uh, Reinhilde, uh, it is, um, okay, uh, in the case of Reinhilde, she has this uh, great comparative summary of green innovation um, and energy policies in the US uh, and beyond. Um, uh, and in the case of Chad, what I particularly liked about the papers, it's, it's really a, a great summary, particularly for non-lawyers, of the, how various climate-related uh, uh, trade actions could bump up to the limits of WTO law, right? So it, it just explains this just in much easier terms for any lawyer than I have ever seen. So, I mean, only for that reason, you should go uh, to, uh, to read that paper. Okay, but then beyond that, you know, both papers have in common that they point out that there are all these inherent trade-offs, right? And that's, again, refreshing because it is often lost in this discussion where we tend to think that, you know, uh, everything just goes in one direction and, and, and we, we are a little too, uh, uh, too quick, I think, into rush into policy actions, in part for understandable reasons, because we are running out of time, that could lead to unintended consequences. And so ba both papers are very much about unintended consequences and both papers do a very valiant job of, in a sense, distilling compromises uh, and also pointing out to how compromises are actually very difficult uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to carry out. Okay, with this now, let me go a little bit into uh, uh, Chad's and Kim's uh, paper. And so uh, what, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna give you the key narrative and I'm going to give you an alternative narrative, which you can interpret as disagreeing with a key narrative, or you can interpret it as complementing the key narrative. Just to say, I basically completely, I'm completely on board with any, all of the policy conclusions of, of uh, uh, Kim's and Chad's paper. But I think if you look it through it, up to the facts through the eyes of my narrative, you'll discover additional uh, policy implications, which are at least as important as the ones they point out, right? So that's essentially the plan for the, for the talk. So this is my, the way I read the paper. Uh, so, you know, starting with this beautiful jet paper by Catherine and, and Kim with that approach, through that lens, they start out with this observation that we have heterogeneous approaches to fighting climate change that they actually may have um, uh, spillovers in the trade competitiveness area that induce uh, trade conflict and that could be very costly to global prosperity, particularly you know, in itself, because the trade system might fall apart, but particularly also because it might undermine global uh, cooperation that we need for many reasons, including uh, climate. They then have this, you know, great analysis of the WTO. It's not able to resolve these tensions in its uh, current state, both by design and because it is dysfunctional. WTO reform is needed, uh, and they describe how they would reform it, but they also say do not expect too much from it, and that was a little underemphasized by Kim's presentation, so the whole point is that the WTO was designed, as I understand it, to solve a particular problem, market access, and, and most of the things that are forbidden uh, by the, uh, various, you know, the subsidies and countervailing um, duties regime, for example, they are designed to, in a sense, mute or blunt instruments that, ways in which countries can cheat, essentially, to prevent that access. So it's not particularly designed to solve the problem we are, you know, these direct spillovers from, from 
climate actions that we have uh, now. And so they then conclude that we, we need some kind of plurilateral structure where you know the, the big guys just sit together, look themselves in the eye and say, look, we're gonna emulate some of the stuff that is already in the WTO, but we're gonna make it more explicit. We're going to make the context clear, which is it's gonna be about these types of policy actions, right? Not the standard market access debate of the WTO. And very importantly, it's not going to just restrict trade harmful policies, but it's also gonna restrict retaliation to those policies, right? That's, that's the beauty of what they say. So it's like a Geneva Convention, essentially, of economic warfare triggered by these conflicts. And I agree uh, with, with all of this. Okay, so here's my narrative. So I, I start in a completely different way, which is that, in my view, there's no intrinsic reason why climate policy heterogeneity should lead to trade tension. It does, but there's no reason why it should. And so I think that the trade tension creating elements of policy in, in the, you know, policy that is in these packages in the US, EU, and China are not about climate policy at all. They reflect other motivations that were swept and added to these uh, packages. And so if we're gonna reduce conflict, what we really need to understand these climate extrinsic motivations and either fight them or address them in ways that are as collaboration friendly as possible. Right. To, to the extent that these climate extrinsic motivations were needed as part of these packages to make these packages politically feasible, as we heard this morning, we cannot just fight them. Right? We're going to have to address them in other ways. But we should have think about this separately from the implications of climate actions. Okay, so there are basically two claims uh, behind this complementary narrative, and I'm going to show you one table illustrating both claims, and then I'll say what, what follows for policy from this, and then I'm, I'm done. So this is my first claim. Climate policy heterogeneity need not imply trade tensions. So what I've done here is on, in the left col uh, column, I've written down all the climate instruments that I think one can legitimately argue for. So the, these may be more instruments than you really need, right? So Pierre Wunsch may not like half of this. Maybe, maybe he's right. Right? But I think if one sort of writes down a long list of policies that are legit, they would end up somewhere here. So obviously the carbon price, then I would add two subsidies on the consumption side, which are about changing consumer behavior that you can argue have to do with maybe behavioral issues, energy efficiency subsidies, or maybe credit market failures, right? In the case of energy efficiency subsidies, green consumption subsidies, you're nudging people to change their consumption patterns, and like EVs are one, one, one example, um, you know, or you can say this can be justified simply by the environmental externalities of, of these goods. So all, all good arguments. Then, you know, as a German, uh, we invented clean energy subsidies. We are by far the biggest country uh, producing these subsidies. They were very controversial. They were very expensive in Germany. We've been trying to reduce them, but they will still be bigger, at least as the Congressional Budget Office projections of the equivalent pot of subsidies in the IRA. So I think clean energy subsidies are okay. So this is what was referred to this morning as deployment subsidies. This is for deployment capacity in the production of clean energy, right? So you either do feed-in tariffs um, for clean energy or you do investment subsidies, for example, uh, to construct a wind farm. And then finally, you know, our most sacred category of subsidies that we all rally around, thanks to Philippe, but also people like Van Hilde's green innovation subsidies. We clearly believe uh, in those. Now, on the right column, I'm arguing that none of these subsidies needs to impart a negative competitiveness effect on, on foreign firms, or rather a positive one on domestic firms. So the carbon price obviously is gonna be adverse, first order. You can offset the adverse impact through a non-discriminatory CBAM, but not fully, because they will still be disadvantaged in third markets, uh, because uh, CBAMs do not import, involve export subsidies. I don't see any distortionary effects on trade from consumption-directed uh, subsidies. With respect to clean energy subsidies, it depends a lot. So, I mean, in, in principle, these subsidies are supposed to, to offset the higher cost from going to green uh, energy sources, right? And so whether in, in the end it, it ends up 
hurting or harming domestic producers depends a lot of whether they are asked to contribute to that higher cost in the end, right? So in Germany, the way it used to work is it, the subsidy is not paid for the, by the state, the subsidy is paid for by the electricity consumers, and then the energy intensive industry gets a rebate, but it doesn't fully offset. I mean, it sets them back to where they would have been without the subsidy. And that's why it's okay under state aid rules, right? This has been notified under state aid rules uh, for a long time. So again, it depends on how you design it, but there's no argument in principle for why this should, should be a protectionist, or should have a protectionist effect. And then on green innovation subsidies, I mean, if you take Philippe's past dependency point, that you know, you're helping a firm innovate and that you know, puts it into a position to do more innovation in the future and that may create a competitive advantage. That is agreed, but again, it depends a lot on the design of the subsidy. I mean, after all, you know, part of the reason why you give the subsidy is because of the innovation externality, right, which benefits other firms. Uh, and they don't have to pay for that either. So it is all about the design. They, they, they have no obvious trade effects. So now claim two. Sorry. Oops. That was deadly. Okay. Claim two. The policies that produce trade tensions that they, you know, Kim and uh, uh, Chad have in mind actually generally have non-climate motives. So the first one is the domestic content requirement. Can this be justified on climate basis? Of course not, because it just makes everything more expensive. Right? Can it be uh, justified with security arguments? Well, de facto, it's being justified with a security argument. I mean, I said yes here because de facto it is. You know, if you're thinking about French shoring, you might be a little more skeptical of this argument, right? So perhaps I should have put a possibly rather than a yes. Is this an exercise of economic nationalism? So I, I prefer the word economic nationalism to protectionism because it's, it's a bit broader and because it sort of makes the point that you know, the motivation behind this is that we simply prefer, you know, to have jobs, good jobs at home when we think, and this might be wrong, of course, that the alternative to having them at home is to having them somewhere else, right? It's the zero-sum uh, mentality, very much so, right? So this is, this is, the, this is straight uh, protectionist or nationalist, if you want. The domestic assembly requirement, again, I don't see any climate argument. There's a possible security argument uh, if you think that you know this is somehow critical and then you could be cut off, but again, it can be done in different ways through international strategies, uh, French shoring, and in any case, you know it is far less uh, security critical than say getting cut off from Russian gas. Domestic uh, self-sufficiency target. So this is uh, so if I if I can criticize uh, Chad and Kim for one thing, it's uh, is they are they are too easy on the EU. Uh, so particularly the last iteration, and that's because you're, you're stopped with uh, von der Leyen's uh, speech in February, um, which was fine. But you know, if you look at what has come out of that, it's appalling, right? I mean, particularly the NZIA that is discussed in, in um, Ryan Hilder's paper is, is a truly appalling piece of legislation because it marries openly protectionist objectives, like a domestic self-sufficiency target, right? They actually go for import substitution a numerical import substitution target, but on the other hand, they don't have serious instruments to actually get there, right? And so most people just shrug and say, well, you know, that kind of cancels. For me, this doesn't cancel, because we are endorsing, essentially, protectionism in a piece of EU legislation. And then we are meek and pathetic and cannot actually follow through and do it, right? Now, in the meantime, they are doing other things. So this is only one bit of the EU response. On the whole, probably the EU response will come out okay. But again, impossible to justify this with climate arguments. Security arguments, it's a bit like domestic content requirements, you know, possibly a bit. But you need an international strategy, really, to, to, to deal with security. And again, I think it's an exercise in economic nationalism. Now, the, the most interesting one, and possibly the one I, we are going to disagree over, and so I put down the possibly because of Philippe, I don't actually think it is, is that you can, maybe there's a climate justification. So, so the argument why I don't think it has a climate justification is because the innovation externalities are taken care of by the innovation subsidy. The environmental externality is taken care of by the renewable energy subsidy. So you are doing what the Germans did. You are creating a huge demand for solar panels through the deployment subsidy. Do you really need to have 
a unit by unit subsidy of production of solar panels on top of that? What could possibly justify that? So if you asked sort of an economist, they will say, okay, well, we have obviously all these externalities, but externalities are not all sources of market failures. We also have things like you know, non-convexities in production, learning by doing, increasing returns to scale, fixed cost of production. So surely, if you have a big innovate, uh, uh, like an investment subsidy or a, or a production subsidy for manufacturing, that helps you get around these big fixed costs of production. Yeah, but we have this problem with every single manufacturing good. And usually, our way of getting around that is credit markets. So maybe I could buy this argument in a economy that has no functioning credit market and a huge need uh, to support a firm uh, to put down a lot of money to build a factory. I do not buy this uh, for the US. OK, so then the question is, this is my last slide, what are the policy implications of this view? So first, I should emphasize that most, if not all, so there's only one tiny caveat of Chad and Kim's recommendations for WTO reform and plurilateral agreements continue to apply. Why? Because they don't actually need the intellectual step of saying um, th this is because it deals with in the inherent um, you know, competitiveness problems or, or trade conflict that is induced by climate policy per se, right? They would dis de mitigate discriminatory policy, whatever its motive, right? They're sort of a catch-all. The, the one small caveat is that I think I'm a little less convinced, and I know that I'm in a minority, for, of the case for reform of the WTO subsidies regime. I mean, how would you reform it? Clearly, the, pro the currently prohibited subsidies, which are linked to local content requirements, should remain prohibited. Yeah, you don't, guys don't want to change that. What you want to do is maybe create this or go back to a category of non-actionable subsidies that's explicitly tied to climate. But I've just argued that you can get legitimate subsidies of this type off the hook, even within the current system. So for me, this is not a, a huge constraint. I, of course, I'm in favor of doing something like that. But I think the current regime is fine because it gives enough flexibility. And then the third and most important point is we need to confront the non-climate related motives uh, for discrimination. And, and this requires first finding policies that reconcile security and trade openness. So um, Maury talked about a bit about that. And I think that's the next big thing we really need to do. We need to be you know, more surgical about this. We need, we need to assess the trade-offs uh, better. And it's hellishly difficult. We know that, which is why I hope that you guys will help. <laughs> and of course, we need to resist most forms of economic nationalism and protectionism. Now, why did I put in this caveat? Maybe I wouldn't have put in this caveat a few years ago. So even I'm getting corrupted in, in thinking that maybe, just maybe, there are settings where economic nationalism might be justified in advanced countries. By the way, it's pretty clear that it is justified, pretty generally, in countries that catch up. And that was, you know, um, uh, Hamilton's argument for economic nationalism in his famous report on manufacturers, right? And, and the reason why it's justified for those countries is because it's a straightforward Im implication of the case for industrial policy, right? So if you think, if your country doesn't have an industry because it leads to learn, in the meantime, there's a dominant country that is, has captured the entire world market. Then, of course, if you, if you apply the standard industrial policy argument for government support of, of firms that otherwise will not get industrial growth of, because of, say, learning by doing problems, you have to implement it in a discriminatory way. You cannot give it to the Brits, right, from the perspective of Hamilton in, in 1791, who already know how to do this stuff, right? Now, the big question is, if you are the most advanced country in the world with the most flexible innovation system, with the best financial system, is there still an argument to do it? And you know, implicitly, the argument is, yes, maybe, because China is catching up too fast. It's overtaking us. And that's a threat. And so maybe there is some link between the security argument and the economic nationalism argument in in advanced countries. Or, you know, there could be a political link. And then the question is, do you call that political link an externality, like Daniel Roderick does? Good jobs externality? And you sort of bring it into the fold of economics, or do you say, oh, in principle, one shouldn't do it, but then we have 
implementation issues, political economy issues, and we should do it. So I think there's a big, big debate to be had there, which has not been had. And you discover this debate by, by thinking about the same problems that Chad and Kim are thinking about, uh, just very slightly different from what they have done in their very, very nice paper. Thank you. Thank you very much for four excellent presentations. Can I ask you up to the table? Uh, This is not on now, it is on. Um, Kim and uh, Rainilda to comment on all these thoughts. Of course, you'll have to make it rather brief. Uh, I'm sure we can continue the discussion uh, later, but, but please, Kim, and then uh, also Chad, of course, if you want to come in. Yeah, so I, I fully agree with both of the discussants. I think these are excellent points. I uh, We wrote that paper in a very quick fashion, and Chad may recall that we wanted to put more in there about the rest of the world. and. And that's to come, I hope. Um, but that's an extremely important point. And, and I agree with your recasting as well, um, not to be too agreeable. But um, I guess the, my only question for you, which we can follow up with afterwards and doesn't need to be now, is I, I think uh, it's absolutely essential to go after the things that you're talking about. But I'm sometimes left shrugging a little about what exactly we do to reconcile security and openness. <laughs> aside from resisting economic nationalism, and I'm all for resistance, um, because I, I think it is uh, misguided in almost every context, most especially now, but you know, I don't have a great set of policy tools for what to do next, and I'll, I'll check out that one citation you had. Um, uh, uh, one other follow-up that I just kind of didn't quite get to is I actually think there are some reasons to hope for a shift in the US policy perspective in the years ahead, because there's gonna be a couple events that I think might lead to rethinking, one of which is the expiration of the Trump tax cuts in 2025. And I think that expiration, it costs three and a half trillion dollars to extend those. Oh my those. God. Um, and, and Biden himself has said that he wants to extend the vast majority of them, um, and the Republicans certainly want to extend all of them. Um, so this is gonna lead to a sort of a fiscal reckoning on top of whatever fiscal reckoning we're already doing. And, and so I do view this opportunistically, and maybe I'm too much of an optimist, but as a chance to maybe pivot more towards uh, the price-based approach, and, to, and, and that can be one form of the resistance, really, is to align better with what others are doing. Thank you. Do you want to say anything, Chad? No? Chad is there. You can solve it afterwards. Mm -hmm. Rainilda, please. Yeah. Uh, indeed, it was a very great discussion. Um, yeah, so I'm very happy to be in this panel here. So two points on, on, on Mori. So uh, on resilience, that uh, there is an under uh, incentive to invest uh, in, in resilience, and it definitely also holds for innovation. Because if you look at the examples that I gave in terms of recycling, reuse, energy efficiency, this modular, none of those are being chosen in any of the recent um, IRA or uh, um, net zero here, although they tick all the boxes, but still they were not uh, chosen here. So it's not only that the market will not uh, pick them, but also from a policy perspective, apparently, uh, there is an under incentive here, which might again also reflect a bit, maybe there are other uh, motives here than purely uh, resilience uh, that, that are playing. In terms of for the poorer countries, how to get the innovation machine for the poorer countries, um, I was a bit short on that and I hope in the paper to be a bit more elaborate, but there are, there are two dimensions that you need to take into account for innovation. So on the one hand is making sure that these less developed countries have access to, to these uh, innovations here. And I, I think the extent to which there is policy support for programs, that that should also be tied to providing access uh, for less developed countries uh, for these technologies here as a compensation for the subsidies uh, that you get uh, here. Um, also, um, in terms of, of not just only access to, but also having specific technologies developed for which the less developed countries don't have the capacity here. I think that's exactly why we need this, this uh, uh, global platform uh, here where there would be global missions defined particularly for, for these uh, here as well. Um, and then for German, um, I, 
I really also buy this other motivations uh, story uh, here. Um, and for innovation, I think there is definitely also the danger of the rhetoric not being on strategic autonomy and resilience here, but really about leadership uh, in technology here and actually prohibiting that, uh, that others would actually uh, become uh, technology leaders here. And that means restricting actually access to technology for, for others uh, here. Um, and if that's the case, then actually the innovation machine will not be powerful enough uh, here. And then you, you actually have also the same kind of resilience arguments uh, extended to the technology domain here. So there is then also perhaps a case of technology resilience here. Uh, and that can also, that, that will be very, very dangerous here. And I think there is rhetoric that goes in that direction uh, as well here. And that will not be the efficient way in which we can steer the innovation machine. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have time for some questions for, from the audience as well. Philippe, you first, and then, yes. Uh, thank you. Yes. A great presentation and great discussion. Uh, um, I, I had a few, just a few very brief questions. I mean, I think one issue with the WTO and is on the one hand, you want to facilitate technology transfers, green technology, but you want to prevent pollution heavens. So how do you do that? I mean, you want to make sure that you know, some countries do not take advantage of free trade to become a pollution heaven. So you want to make sure that what you know, for example, carbon tariffs can help or threat of carbon tariffs, but you, of course they can be abused and, and, and derail the WTO. So how do you deal with that? That's one question. Uh, a second question, uh, the technology transfers. I think one idea, you know, Michael Kramer in 96 had a very interesting paper where he said, you know, you have a trade-off between the production of innovation and the, and the diffusion of innovation. You don't want that the diffusion expropriates the producer of innovation. And so he had thought of the idea that you could have auctions and uh, there would be a kind of fund that would have a social markup on the auction and would buy the uh, innovation from the innovator and diffuse it. Can we have sovereign wealth funds of joint sovereign wealth funds of a community of countries, a G20, I don't know, that would play the role of the Michael Kramer, but adapted to uh, green innovations to diffuse the green technologies? So is there any thinking on that? Okay. Next, uh, next thing, and I'm, I'm almost done. China, US, the China Initiative. I've been doing work with David Stromberg and other co-authors where we showed the very negative effect of the China Initiative on Chinese research. But there's been a, a complementary paper by Rishi Jia, I never know how to pronounce her name, showing that there were negative effects also on, on US research. And what do we make of the China Initiative when it comes to green? Obviously, they were bad for Chinese research and for US research. What do we make of that? And my last point is on... Uh, uh, yeah, targeted, untargeted, yeah, uh, is that, you know, uh, uh, I take the point that you made, you know, subsidies, but there are issues whenever you have an S-curve problem, you know, you need to coordinate resources to go from very basic research to application. Whenever you have coordination problem, uh, there uh, you may need more than credit market. The, cre the credit market would not have solved the DARPA problem, for example, in the 1950s, you see what I mean, where you need to uh, achieve a mission in a very limited amount of time. Credit, I, I believe a lot in the role of credit, uh, uh, but for such a thing, and, and I think green is like the DARPA problem, uh, uh, you need the credit market, but you also need to solve the S-curve problem, and that's where smart industrial policy might be useful. Sorry for being long. Yes, that was a little bit long. We have a long list of questions here. So thank you for that. You take notes and you, you'll be back. Yes, you gentleman by the phone, well, by the microphone, thank, please. Thank you. Yes. So I'm, I'm from the World Bank. So of course, very interested in this impact on lower income countries. And I think very often everybody acknowledge it's very important, but we don't really get into the what does it mean for the policies. And I think we have one question on the access of the green goods. And we have anecdotal evidence from Africa, for instance, that access to solar panels is becoming more difficult. And those countries, I mean, we tell them like all of these policies will make technologies cheaper in 10 years, but we need, they need those panels just now. And I think, so there is a question of in the next two to three years, are we blocking low income countries transition and energy access uh, because of, of some of those policies? And I haven't seen a lot of analysis on this, so that would be really important. The second aspect is they ask for not access to the goods, but access to the technologies and to be part of the development of those technologies. There are a lot of European projects in Africa, Mauritania, Namibia. What's really striking is it's all to meet European demands, and we don't hear anything about how those projects can help development in those countries, how do population benefit from them, 
if that's not part of the discussion, there will be local backlash. And, and I, I feel like if we want those countries to be part of that deal, we need to show how it helps their development, and that's really missing in, in our conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, our friend from, from South Korea, and then Chad, and then you will be given the possibility Hi, uh, to respond. My name is Han Kuyo. Uh, this is my second day at Peterson as a senior fellow. I was former trade minister of Korea. A fascinating discussion. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to pick up the, the last slide from Kim and you know, Chad about what would be the best forum to address this issue. Because I mean, we talk about this fragmentation among these three largest economies in the world, but also this global you know, south between advanced versus this global south. So, I mean, we talk about this uh, CBAM and uh, you know, climate club, et cetera, but there's not really kind of, con I mean, bridging or connecting between advanced versus this developing country. But in that sense, the Biden administration, you know, launched this Indo-Pacific economic framework, and there's a decarbonization pillar, right? And if you look at these 14 countries, I think it has, um, you know, the most advanced country, but also, you know, this uh, developing country, resource rich, but also resource uh, poor, and also manufacturing, you know, based economy, but also services based economy. So. Uh, I think it could be also useful forum if it is designed and negotiated, you know, in a, in a right way. So how do you see, for example, in this iPad, what do you want to see uh, you know, from this, you know, decarbonization pillar? What would be the kind of a priority you want to see as a final delivery? Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome to Peterson. Chad. Um, so I have a really hard question for Kim. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, I have a question for Wright Hilda. Let me, maybe I can just answer that one, though, so you don't have to, Kim, when we get there. So I, this is a super important point. Um, IPEF and the things that the United States is doing sort of informally through soft law negotiations can perhaps socialize a lot of these issues. Um, you know, admittedly, when Kim and I started on this, we wanted to embed what we were doing in reality. And the only conversations that we can see <clears throat> the U.S. really kind of thinking hard about uh, the, the areas of conflict that we thought needed to be addressed was first the EU, the US-EU relationship, um, and then we thought, well, we have to talk about China there, and so that could give us a, a, a way to bring it in. Um, and also the idea of having the EU in the room on anything is good for rules, um, and so would ultimately potentially be more WTO consistent. Than, and so it's a shortcut way of getting a, around actually getting the WTO there effectively is, is to bring the, w, the EU into the picture. Um, so anyway, that was our, our general approach, but not disagreeing with the importance of, of what you suggested. My question for Reinhilde, the pandemic. Um, and I, I want to basically ask you about some of the innovations that we may have learned from the, from the pandemic that we could apply to, the, to the, the climate crisis. Are you... So one thing that came up that I became fascinated with, uh, you know, is the work of Michael Kramer and Susan Athey and, and all those folks that were talking about advanced market commitments to try to create new markets for, you know, as yet undeveloped technologies to create the right incentives to, are we seeing some of that potentially be a, being applied uh, in, in on the ground in terms of facilitating some of the innovations? It's not just money. Right? It's, it's actually kind of creating the incentives to, to, to do innovations differently than we have in the past. Can you tell us a little bit about what we're seeing there? Quite a lot. Why don't you start, Reinhilde, and then Kim, and then I will be giving Maurice and, and Jeremy yeah, possibilities if you want to have some final comments as well. Go in the reverse order. So thanks, Chet, for uh, raising that question because that's something uh, that's really also close to my heart. I've been working also on, on, on like vaccine technologies and how we could actually um, uh, improve on that. And there is a lot to be learned also for, for the green perspective here by indeed using these advanced uh, market commitments here, kind of public procurement, mm -hmm. because also in the green area, that will be very important. The, the, the government, certainly in terms of utilities, is also very often a procurer and can use that instrument uh, as well. Unfortunately, it's, it's very little use of, of the procurement instrument from an innovation perspective. Uh, it's not that they're not procuring, but they're not using it as a way to really uh, also support 
the innovations that are needed within uh, the new te so within the procurement here. So in that respect, they don't take any risk uh, here, and that's very often because of, of, of fiscal considerations here. You just go for the lowest uh, price here, and that of course doesn't build in any extra incentive here for innovation. And in that respect, for the moment, it doesn't uh, really work here. Something else that could could also be be used, and it also relates then to the question from from the World Bank here is these advanced market commitments could then also come with, again, a condition of uh, if we buy these and if we provide support here, we will also make, um, we will also put as a constraint that you have to make these things also available for less developed countries at the lower price here. And that, again, will also uh, help uh, the diffusion of these technologies uh, as well. Um, and then finally, uh, in terms of access, um, uh, to, techno to technologies for less developed countries. The EU has indeed these, these programs here. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you also agree that they are not really perfectly working. I think we also need to have more of these um, characteristics of public-private uh, partnerships here where you really also make sure that you involve all the relevant stakeholders in the design of these programs uh, here. And in, in, in the case of these uh, missions for, for less developed countries here, that means also involving the stakeholders from these countries as well here from the start in the design of these programs here. And hopefully uh, that will help to, to make them a bit more effective. Um, on, on the question of pollution havens and, and more generally on forums, which I think I'm gonna try to find a way to smush those together. I mean, I, I think one of the keys he, here is finding a way to truly address the the moral, economic, and efficiency issues associated with the rest of the world. And I think um, Maury's slides pointed to some directions forward for funding and options and, and capacity. I, I was struck by some work by uh, Stephanie Stancheva on the, the uh, public opinion around some of these policy tools that, that carbon pricing isn't particularly possible, but it's, it, uh, sorry, uh, isn't particularly popular, but it does increase in popularity when you explain it to people. It doesn't seem to increase in pop popularity when you hand money back as rebates, it, at least in her research, which it goes across countries. Um, but I could imagine that it's possible that you could earmark some of these funds, either the, the border adjustment ones or the, the larger funds uh, for the poor countries in a world, and that could be potentially a way to increase, bizarrely, the, the popularity here. And I do think we need some sort of international forum that's a, a kind of akin to what happened in international tax, where we spent a long time wringing our hands and then countries finally came together and 140 of them were like, yeah, we probably should tax multinational company income at some minimum level. You know, I think you could, you could imagine a forum like that. I'm not sure who the convening organization is, but that would help to set some of these um, you know, principles together and hopefully in a way that was, was more lasting. Um, but, I, but I think Maury's slide is a, is a good starting point. There was one final question by John. I think you need to walk to the microphone. Whatever is quickest. <laughs> so, uh, so a, a question to Reinhilde. Uh, you and many use the metaphor that the innovation machine must be steered in the right direction, and in general, for, for us to solve the climate issue. And in general, that's of course true. But is this metaphor really uh, good for, for EU? Uh, I, I find it hard to think that there are, could be any stronger incentives that, than those that are now put in place by the Fit for 55. From 2035, fossil fuel cars are not going to be allowed to be sold. Uh, from 2039, uh, cement, power, uh, 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 steel, all these things need to be fossil free. From 2043, that applies to the whole fossil sector. Uh, and, but if, and so all these firms there, they need to close if they cannot come up with fossil-free incentives. But the business opportunities are, of course, going to be there. So it's an enormously strong uh, policy in steering innovation in the right direction. And, and I, I am afraid that this metaphor is, not, is, 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 is powerful in actually driving the problems that Jeremy are, is talking about. So, so we get policies that are not really helpful, but, but do these other bad things. 
Yeah, well, very short. So I think you make the point that steering is important, but of course it has to have the right kind of steering. And that's that's the tricky thing here, like also what Jeremy is very tricky, very challenging, very complex. We can make a lot of mistakes by steering wrongly here as well. And, and steering wrongly will also have big effects uh, as well here. So I think it has, we all agree, it has to be steered. We have to find out how to steer it in the right way here, um, which is challenging, but that's why I'm also calling for way more experimentation, trying to steer, but making sure that you very closely monitor whether you go in the right direction here and, and, and be able to very quickly adjust your policy choices uh, when needed here. So it's learning how to steer, that's the, that's the thing, but it needs to be steered. Thank you. Jeremy, Maurice, did you have any? comments to, or, or pick up on the questions? Yeah. So, so I, 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 I pick up on two points on Kim, how exactly do we uh, reconcile economic openness and security? The difficulty here is in the word exactly. <laughs> so in principle, you give the answer in your paper, diversification, right? There's two complications to that, which is when you diversify, of course, you have to weight in, in some sense the potential security risk of a particular imported or exported product or supply chain with the nature of that product. So like uh, Jim Stock pointed out, uh, you know, lithium prices, once you have your capacity installed, are far less relevant, maybe irrelevant for your economic security than gas prices, which you need on a flow basis, right? So that's number one. Number two, you will probably have to weight them with some sort of threat or, or shock probability. Right, some distribution of what could go wrong in the world out there. It's not just security shocks. It could be the next pandemic, you know, port closures, and of course you have to worry about domestic shocks as as well. So that's complication number one. And then the super complication is maybe some of these shocks are endogenous, right? Particularly these security shocks. So it's hyper complicated, which is why I hope that Chad will write a paper and and, and solve it uh, solve it all. On Philippe's point, so so thank you for making this this point on coordination. I guess my point is that. It, or my, it's an, a question to you, we can discuss it offline. I, I find it difficult to believe that you need production unit based subsidies to achieve that coordination when you already have a massive deployment subsidy that basically tells the photovoltaic industry your demand in the US has just quintupled over the next 10 years. Isn't that coordination? enough, right? That, that's my question. And then Stefan's super important uh, point on what's happening to the global south. So is there essentially a crowding out effect now where all the deployment is being pulled into the, to the advanced countries? So my, my sense of this, but I'm not an expert, is that I'm, I'm not so sure there is, it would be a physical shortage or a price effect in, that crowds out deployment in, in the emerging markets, in part because, of course, the IRA has one very beneficial spillover, uh, which is that China's going to be, it's a bit like a sanction on, on Chinese, on the Chinese value exchange, right? And so just like the sanction on Russian gas, it means these goods are going to be redirected to the emerging market world, probably rather cheaply, given the enormity of supply there. So the main problem, I, I think, is that the EMs, you know, probably won't be able, they're not in a great position to develop their own uh, you know, learning by doing there, but that's more of a medium term problem. But mainly it's about money, right? It's about buying this stuff. And so here I'm persuaded with, with Bea's uh, scheme to save the world, which is that we give everyone, in principle, a carbon budget that corresponds, it's simply the remaining world carbon budget uh, divided by the number of people in your country. And then if you want, you can trade that away. Uh, and, you know, indeed, it will mostly be traded away because it would be hugely inefficient to actually keep it, right? The US is gonna really buy, you know, buy very high prices for, for those carbon entitlements. So if we can implement that scheme somehow, it would solve all problems. Good, we've solved that then. Maurice, please. Uh, just, just briefly on this pollution haven point. Uh, I think dealing with that requires carrots and not just sticks. Uh, it's a little bit like, um, you know, telling, telling uh, low income countries, well, we're not gonna give you vaccines, but, uh, you can't enter our country unless you're vaccinated. You know, you have to, <laughs> right, there has to be some, some, some resources there. And I think the suggestion about um, sovereign wealth funds, great suggestion. The World Bank is, um, 
uh, and other MDBs are um, in the midst of an initiative to um, leverage their capital more efficiently uh, for climate and health purposes, which I think will help. It's clearly not enough. And so I think this is, this is a first order issue. We can't just, uh, you know, penalize uh, imports from developing countries on the grounds that they're carbon intensive when we're not providing the requisite support for them to solve the problem, and as Stefan said, to solve their development problem more generally. Thank you so much. This has been fascinating. I have learned uh, a lot, and it has also given uh, more thoughts to discuss. Uh, there is lunch now. Uh, yeah. Adam, please, uh, did you just, want to say anything before we thank no, the panel? No, no. First, just thank you all. That was terrific. Thank you very much. Applause. Yes. <laughs> And second, that we have lunch now and we'll reconvene at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you. Hey, madam.
real world, which is the virtual world. Um, I'm Adam Posen, president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and this will be the closing panel of our two-day conference on the macroeconomic implications of climate action, organized by Jean Pisani Ferry and myself. Um, as you've already heard today, for those of you who were in the earlier sessions, we changed the focus from some of the more national and technical issues to some still technical important issues on the international side today. We had a important um, discussion with Jennifer Harris, Christiane Nickel, and Beatrice Vader Di Mauro on where the policy stands, particularly in the US and Europe, but then a session discussing the consequences of policy heterogeneity across countries, chaired by Cecilia Malmstrom, with presentations by Chad Baum, Kimberly Clausing, and Ryan Hilda Fugler, or rather presentations by Chad and Ryan Hilda, and discussion by Maury Obsfeld and Jeremy Zettelmeyer. We would like to now turn even more full square into the international aspects of today's topic with our discussion today, I'm privileged to have uh, four people who have been policy makers, academics, thinkers, and thought leaders. And we are delighted to have them with us. In alphabetical order of their last names by which we will speak, we will have them speak. First up is Suman Berry, who is the vice chairperson of Niti Ayog. Uh, in the rank and status of a cabinet minister in India since May of 2022. Um, as, as, as Suman has explained to many of us, uh, Niti Ayog is essentially the planning structural reform uh, economics agency of the Indian government. And he will, of course, be speaking in his capacity as an Indian minister. Prior to his appointment, he was a senior visiting fellow at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi, a global fellow of the Asia program of the Woodrow Wilson International Center, and a non-resident fellow of our friends at Bruegel. Um, from 2012 to 2016, he was Royal Dutch Shell's global chief economist, and prior to that had served as director general of the National Council of Applied Economic Research in New Delhi. Um, he's previously worked at the World Bank he brings, therefore, a multifaceted uh, perspective, including time as working for one of the major energy companies globally. To his left is Mauricio Cardenas. Uh, forgive my pronunciation, Mauricio, I'm sorry. He is professor of professional practice in global leadership at Columbia University SIPA and director of the MPA there in global leadership. He's also a senior global senior research fellow at Columbia Center in global energy policy. Um, during the administration of Juan Manuel Santos, Dr. Cardenas was Colombia's energy minister from 2011 to 2012 and finance minister from 2012 to 2018, serving long time with distinction as Colombia came out of difficulties and moved into a new era. Um, he's also served in three other cabinet positions in previous governments in economic development, transport, and planning, as well as twice being executive director of FEDES Arroyo, Colombia's leading policy research center, and he's previously worked across the street at Brookings as well. Um, he, was, he has recently served as a member of the WHO Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, co-chair of the Task Force on Carbon Pricing and Net Zero, and chair of the Doing Business External Review Panel for the World Bank, I assume. To his left is our colleague here at Peterson, Cecilia Malmstrom. Uh, as many of you know, she is a former member of the European Commission and European Parliament. Um, she is host of the PIAE's Trade Wins Weekly or Bi-Weekly event series. I Okay, I got the names wrong. No, Malmstrom comes before Wolfram, right? Okay. Okay, sorry. My visual didn't work with my alphabetical. Sorry. Um, that's not going to work. Um, she's also a visiting professor at the School of Business, Economics, and Law at the University of Gothenburg, 
Cecilia has devoted the better part of her career to global affairs and international relations and served as European Commissioner for Trade from 2014 to 2019 and European Commissioner for Home Affairs from 2010 to 2014, where, of course, she was globally involved in migration and other issues. Um, she was first elected as a member of the European Parliament in 1999. Um, of course, while she was European Commissioner for Trade, Cecilia represented the European Union at the WTO and international trade bodies, and she was responsible for negotiating bilateral trade agreements with key countries, including with Canada, Japan, Mexico, Singapore, Vietnam, and the four founding Mercosur countries. Um, I think any USTR would be ashamed to uh, match their record with what Cecilia accomplished. Um, and we're very proud that she's been a fellow here uh, since June of 2021. Finally, uh, we have Catherine Wolfram, who is a visiting professor at the Kennedy School on leave from UC Berkeley. Uh, as mentioned multiple times deservedly, she and Kim Clausing have an important new paper out on international aspects of just what we're talking about, divergences and different pacing and methods, particularly uh, on dealing with climate action, particularly the European uh, pricing versus the American subsidization, but it's more general than that. That paper is forthcoming in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. I don't mean to focus on one paper. Um, Catherine also served for 18 months as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate and Energy Economics at the U.S. Treasury, just ending just last year. Um, she is the Cora Jane Flood Professor of Business Administration at UC Berkeley and previously served as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the Haas School at Berkeley. Um, in addition, she was the Program Director of the NBER's Environment and Energy Economics Program, Faculty Director of the E2E Project, a research organization focused on energy efficiency, and she has been publishing extensively on the economics of energy markets. Previously, before joining Berkeley, she was an assistant professor of economics at Harvard. So, those bios are compelling, even more so the insights we hope to have from our colleagues. Some of our colleagues have, who are seeking, have prepared slides, they can speak from here. Those who have decided not to use slides can stay seated or come here, but first, over to Suman Barry. Thank you. The clicker? The clicker. Um, Adam, um, my thanks to you and uh, Jean uh, for this uh, invitation to speak at uh, a very important and prestigious uh, event. And also it has the uh, co-benefit, if I can use that language, of reuniting me with many former Bruegel colleagues. Uh, yes, I'm here as uh, uh, a minister, uh, minister and vice chairman of Niti Aayog, but this is by no means an official statement, so there's an implicit disclaimer there, uh, which is that I'm here to basically learn and to make uh, the audience here aware of how India is positioning itself for the great transition um, and also uh, the specific topic, the implications for the global economy. So my uh, prepared remarks were submitted uh, on Monday morning before we had the benefit of the terrific discussions yesterday and today. So I will, um, uh, uh, I will, um, present uh, the essentials of the India story, but then as I turn to uh, the implications of, for the global economy, I will make use of uh, many of the insights that I've learned uh, that have come across in the last um, um, day and a half. Okay, so I think the first point is that uh, India is very much a climate believer, and I would attribute this to my boss, the Prime Minister. Uh, he did a U-turn at Paris, uh, went in the face of, as it were, the prior uh, position of the Indian government, which is that, look, we have to grow, and this is a problem created by uh, the rich countries. Uh, so he committed uh, to uh, the decarbonization agenda, uh, 
And the main reason for doing so, and I think that's relevant to what I'm going to say, is because he did see that, A, this mattered to India, and B, that uh, uh, it was an opportunity, as many have stressed in previous sessions, to uh, be at the leading edge of new technologies. So uh, there is an ambitious climate agenda. Uh, we've had discussions on burden sharing, particularly in what uh, Beatrice had to say about uh, the carbon space, but uh, here uh, these are uh, the numbers that uh, India has included in its low carbon um, uh, roadmap to the um, to the uh, um, to the UN. Um, um, and um, in terms of commitments that it's already made, it's amongst the top five best performing countries. And um, it's, it has the fourth highest renewable capacity in the world after US, China, and G Geneva, so, and uh, Germany. So uh, it can't be uh, accused of being a, a climate laggard, which was a phrase that was um, used um, earlier in the conference. Ha it has to manage uh, an energy trilemma. Uh, and I think that's the important point, which is that when you come to somewhere like India, you are talking about an economy which has strong growth aspirations. Prime Minister Modi has articulated a goal of India being a developed country um, by 2047, and energy growth is expected to range around 4% per year, and yet India has committed itself to reducing the emissions intensity of that growth. And let me say that at the same time, we have a uh, substantial challenge on which progress has been made of moving people from traditional fuels to modern fuels. So that uh, bringing modern energy to Indian households is a very important part of the development agenda, and uh, for that to actually be utilized, obviously the energy has to be available, uh, has to be affordable. Uh, then uh, there is the issue of ref reflecting the the, um, the climate constraint, essentially by um, betting on renewables and other technologies as well. But um, also very important, and this was a point made in the Spillenbergo paper yesterday, the issue of, uh, as it were, diversifying your energy resources so that you, uh, your st strategic autonomy is not compromised by embargoes of various kinds, has always been an important part of Indian energy policy. And you can see that um, import dependency on fossil fuels is high, 89% in the case of oil, 50% uh, uh, in the case of gas. Uh, we heard similar numbers uh, for Turkey uh, yesterday. Um, and, of course, we've had the discussion about how, as it were, moving to renewables uh, um, creates other kinds of uh, vulnerabilities. Now, um, we've, you know, um, Carl Sagan talked of trillions and trillions of stars, and we've been talking about trillions and trillions of dollars. Uh, but, um, you know, as was pointed out by Stefan yesterday, uh, there are indeed large uh, um, the investment requirements in doing, and I think I should make this point, doing something which frankly is unprecedented, move, trying to uh, get one-fifth of humanity to improve its standard of living on the basis of relatively new and untried technology. So that is really the uh, bet that Prime Minister Modi has taken uh, or, uh, with the world and you know, the argument about the cross-border aspect, uh, which was echoed a little bit uh, in the previous session, is really what is the constraint and what is the support that is available. And India is doing this partly, uh, um, well, it's certainly uh, affected by climate change, the adaptation um, challenge but also, of course, uh, because it believes that if it is able to pioneer this development trajectory, this will have 
uh, global implications for other parts of the world, particularly South Africa, uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, um, you know, uh, this starts to get into the cross-border dimensions. Uh, there's work uh, that uh, uh, will be done by the World Bank and has, to some extent, been prefigured uh, by uh, the work of Homi Khadas at Brookings uh, about uh, the public finance or the financing challenge of a big investment push and uh, what that the scale of that investment push is uh, is, I think, uh, still to be determined. The figure here is 7% of GDP. Stefan had made the point uh, yesterday about how much of this is uh, gross and, and net. But the fact still remains that uh, we don't have the kind of tax base that a rich country does. Um, and uh, to increase domestic savings is to reduce domestic consumption. And so there is, in that sense, a welfare trade-off if you were to choose to uh, finance this largely uh, domestically. So uh, let us, as a thought experiment, say that what we're trying to do is to increase the, save, the investment rate by about two percentage points of GDP um, for a couple of decades, because that's the estimate. The question then is, uh, what are the sources of financing? Uh, there's also uh, an indication here of an issue that came up earlier in the conference, which is uh, the fiscal impact of decarbonization. And uh, uh, I'm not including in this uh, any reference to uh, a carbon tax, because for now, drawing on, you know, sort of, um, along the lines of what Stephen had indicated, um, I think carbon pricing comes relatively late in the sequencing, and so we are operating on the basis of other policies, largely because uh, of the uh, fears of the distributional consequences of this. Um, now, uh, there's the question of how much of the investment uh, would be in the public sector, how much in the private sector, and um, this now uh, brings me to some of the kind of cross-border issues. There was a discussion already in what Maury had to say uh, about, as it were, doing things about the, uh, the cost of private finance for uh, particularly the private sector, but also the public sector. And India, as the G20 president, is actively engaged in the debate on uh, changing the terms of multilateral development finance, um, not only direct lending, but also uh, through various credit enhancement kinds of schemes. Now, um, what are some of the cross-border developments um, that could have an impact on the Indian economy? Um, these are some of the perceived obstacles that uh, India feels that it faces, even though it is, um, uh, you know, making uh, uh, a full-throated effort. Let me, uh, let me talk a little bit here about CBAM because um, the whole theory of CBAM and its American equivalent seems to be uh, predicated on the concept of carbon leakage, but I was interested in what Jeremy and others had to say in the last session about appealing to a rather different intellectual construct. And Robert Lawrence, who's left us, did say that there was once the belief that really you should or could aim for a global cap and trade, and that would really be the most kind of efficient way of embarking on the decarbonization um, sort of journey. I say this because, you know, the, if it had, if the uh, theoretical model was basically that uh, there were global allocations of permits, then under those circumstances, I think poorer countries would have been assigned uh, a higher level of permits, which would therefore mean that they had a quote unquote right to pollute uh, and to attract some of the, uh, as it were, 
carbon intensive industries to them. And so in that world, you would not have the concern for carbon leakage, which has now figured so prominently in the EU debate and in the, uh, and increasingly in the US debate. So I just wanted to say that testing the analytic foundations of something like a CBAM is something that a group like this might want to revisit, even though it's probably too far gone in EU legislation, et cetera. Um, I do, uh, in the interest of time, because I think I'm almost out of it, let me then um, uh, go to a, a final cross-border point, which I don't think uh, has received the kind of attention it might. And with uh, luminaries like Maury and others in the room, I, you know, if I'm wrong in the analytics, I'd like that to be pointed out to me. And the point is, is this. I mean, in development economics, we were taught something called the transfer problem. And the transfer problem is basically if you want to absorb real resources from abroad, you have to accommodate those through uh, a larger current account deficit. Otherwise, you are not actually absorbing the real resources from abroad. Now, in, the, in India's macro construction, uh, put um, you know very simply, is a macro construction, I would argue, which has been driven, at least since the Asian financial crisis, by the belief, and that's been a fairly widespread belief in Asia, that uh, you don't want the loss of national sovereignty that is involved in having to go to the fund, and that therefore uh, we've operated the economy on the basis of a speed limit of a current account deficit of no more over the cycle than 2%. There's been some deviations from that. And so my question, the, the cross-border question really is, do we have a global financial system or architecture which would give an India comfort that it could actually run current account deficits of twice that without risking uh, a, uh, a major uh, accident. It's part of the larger issue, which is, uh, you know, uh, Europe basically went for full capital account com convertibility in the mid-'80s. Uh, is my understanding, when most European countries were, were more affluent than even China, let alone India now. But the question really, I think, are two, and then I'll stop here. One, uh, how does one want to restructure global finance so that India and other countries who want to absorb uh, fin external financial resources assuming that they are affordable, can actually run those current account deficits. And I would remind those in the room that at the time that the NICs uh, had their uh, fast growth, they often had current account deficits of 6 and 7%. So um, just to, um, to end, um, there are, if you like, for political reasons in, in the major metropolises, um, there is... A, um, uh, there is a formulation that I think Pierre Wunsch kind of pointed out was in some ways uh, erroneous in its basis, talking about supply destruction and all of that. And my point is that that narrative actually and the uh, consequences of narrative like CBAM, et cetera, make it hard to develop the kind of domestic constituency that a country like India needs to embark on, which is a bold, and I hope not reckless, uh, bet that the world system would support what India wants to do, which is to raise living standards while reducing emissions, despite being the least affluent member of the G20. I think I've overrun, but thanks for your indulgence, Adam.
<laughs> yeah. But what I'm seeing here is not my presentation. This is Martin Wolf. I'm sure it's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can start while, while it gets ready. Thank you so much, Jean Adam, Adam for, for having me here in this group of uh, converted uh, macroeconomists. And I'm happy um, to join the, this club. I have to share with you my moment of revelation. And uh, that happened in 2016 when the Colombian delegation that had been in Paris negotiating the Paris Agreement came back and said that they had agreed to a 31% reduction in emissions by 2030 relative to our, our baseline. And I asked the question, well, how, how are we gonna get there? And, um, and the answer was, well, we need a plan. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, we need a plan and maybe we need something else, we need a carbon tax. And we introduced the carbon tax and it was actually passed in the Colombian Congress in November of 2016. Getting a tax, a carbon tax approved in a country where it's easy to ignite social unrest by raising uh, uh, fuel prices, it's, it's hard. Um, but I have to say also that it's, it's easy to reverse those progresses. So, First message is um, let's not take for granted that uh, the achievements that have been made, including, for example, here in the United States, the IRA, uh, are irreversible. Uh, years later, uh, because of political pressures, uh, especially in the post-pandemic, uh, gasoline prices uh, were frozen. So I'm going to um, essentially talk in these next uh, minutes about uh, the rest of the world. And I think it's, uh, it's very good that in the last two panels we, um, we covered some of that um, because it's hard to think of any uh, global common or global public good uh, that better describes what a public good is than the atmosphere. So if we don't think about the rest of the world, we're not gonna solve the problem. Um, of, uh, of uh, mitigating uh, emissions. When I was putting the title to this uh, talk, I thought about the asymmetries that exist uh, between the advanced economies and, um, and the rest of the world. Um, I could have said, um, let's highlight the inconsistency in today's policies towards climate, or we could also think about the tensions that exist. I think these are like the dimensions I like to, uh, to highlight. Um, let me start by saying that this is putting geography, and I think Beatrice mentioned this this morning, geography, geography is back. And I think it's back with a vengeance because uh, we had underestimated the impact of geography on development and climate certainly puts it at the center uh, because regardless of the institutions, regardless of trade, Geography matters a lot. Uh, whatever you are located in the world uh, has uh, uh, important implications. And think, for example, the percentage of the population uh, that in emerging and developing countries live uh, uh, in low elevation uh, uh, coastal zones. And uh, this is amazingly high as a percentage of the population for the uh, least developed countries. Also, <clears throat> many of the models have underscored the fact, and we've talked about this in the context of Europe, whether Italy is in a better or worse off position, um, most of them also underscore the fact that there is an optimal temperature. There's a lot of debate about what that point is, but certainly um, temperatures are higher in most of the emerging and developing world, and that's where the negative effects of the increase in temperature hit. So um, that's, that's purely uh, factual. So geography, um, has to put us in the frame of mind to think about, uh, about the differential effects of climate change. Second, um, there is good evidence showing that the more exposed countries are also less able to adapt. And here, adapt involves not just um, uh, state capacities, fiscal capacity, legal capacity, um, it, it involves uh, uh, institutional issues, 
so here, the picture is bigger. It's not geography, it's also compounded by the fact that these countries are less able to adapt, and this is particularly the case of uh, low-income countries. And the, the really bad news is that for many of these countries that are highly exposed, it's very hard for them to adapt, there is no fiscal space. And there is no fiscal space because they have exhausted all their borrowing capacities. Uh, this is data from the IMF, which essentially shows that um, uh, many of these uh, um, uh, developing countries, uh, 44 of them, by the way, have negative borrowing space. So you cannot solve these issues by, um, uh, by accessing uh, more debt. And to, to complete the picture about these differential effects, about the asymmetries, about the tensions, we should think in terms of global inequality. I think we're very, um, I think, optimistic about what happened in the past, say, three decades in terms of the reduction in global inequality uh, with the increases in incomes in the bottom of the distribution. But what we're seeing now, according to, to the models, and certainly there's need to do more research on this dimension, is that climate change can actually uh, revert the progress that has been made in terms of the reduction in global inequality, clearly because the countries that are um, at the bottom of the income distribution are the ones that are going to be uh, hit the most. Um, and this is going to cause also some tensions and challenges uh, with other development goals, not just the reduction in inequality, but many people tend to think the achievement of the reduction in emissions as being completely consistent, compatible with achieving the uh, SDGs. And I think we need to be a lot more clear in that direction because it's not, um, it's not that uh, SDGs and mitigation efforts reinforce each other. Certainly there are cases for that, for example, um, in sectors related to uh, the quality of the air, et cetera. But in others, uh, they create tensions uh, because climate action can actually, for example, increase uh, food prices or um, climate action um, will, um, will require uh, new investments in, in technology for agricultural production. Um, there is a paper uh, uh, on, on, on India, by the way, that basically says that achieving the uh, NDCs, the climate goals, can actually, is going to increase the um, demand for resources uh, to um, provide clean water. So, not all the development goals are going in the same direction. Uh, the trade-offs, the tensions, we need to underscore them. There is a lot of uh, buzz in the literature saying that this is, these are two compatible goals. And, and underscoring the tensions is good because when there are trade-offs, you have to prioritize. And I think this is an important element in the, in the conversation. And one aspect, additional aspect I'd like to highlight about these asymmetries is, uh, and connects a little bit with the point about the current account deficit, is um, the relation between um, climate change exposure and trade. Um, a lot of these countries that are highly exposed are not just poor, but also have a high dependency on fossil fuels. So fossil fuels take a large share of, uh, of their exports. And this is data from the WTO, which essentially shows um, that these are countries that are gonna lose foreign exchange, they're gonna lose revenues. So in addition to uh, the, the problems posed by, by climate directly, uh, this is an, uh, a, a consequence. In a recent paper I, wor I, I wrote at, um, at the Central and Global Energy Policy at CEPA, at Columbia University, um, I tried to do a taxonomy of, uh, of the risks that these countries have as, uh, as they move forward in terms of uh, uh, confronting uh, the climate change. Um, some countries are dependent on fossil fuels, some other countries are dependent on mechanized and modern agriculture, others have subsistence agriculture or illegal activities. And in one way or another, they're gonna face very high physical and transitional risks and these, uh, these risks essentially will undermine the capacity to 
um, adopt the policies um, that are necessary to, uh, to reduce uh, emissions. Um, let me also say that the problem of emerging and developing countries is not the lack of ambition. Uh, uh, because many countries in the original nationally determined contributions in the second iteration have been very ambitious. I'm here showing you the data, uh, the level of ambition for some countries, for the countries of Latin America, that's the chart on the left. But at the same time, estimating through um, an integrated assessment model, what will be the global optimal? The global optimal will be to reduce emissions even more in Latin America. The reason is, that Latin America's emissions are essentially agriculture, forestry, land use. Um, these are technologies, uh, reducing emissions in, say, deforestation. It's a technology that is easy and is relatively inexpensive compared to, say, developing uh, green hydrogen or producing green cement. It's, it's relatively low cost. So if you were a global central planner, you would say Latin America should reduce the emissions associated with deforestation much faster. And Latin America should be clearly net negative by mid-century. But there is no market signal. There is no transfer. Uh, there is no way to incentivize that to happen. The central planner global optimum is just not going to, uh, to happen. In fact, if we just stick to the uh, government's own goals, the nationally determined contributions, and you do the numbers and see, well, how many tons of CO2 or CO2 equivalent you have to reduce? What's the price tag for each one of the activities and the technologies, let's put it in that term, uh, to reduce emissions? In some cases, it's about preventing deforestation. In other cases, it's about reforestation. In other cases, it's electrifying transport. You just put the price tag, the price that applies to say, in this case, this group of Latin American countries. Let's add up, make the numbers, and see what that means in terms of investment per year between now and, uh, and 20, uh, uh, 2050. And the numbers are just staggering. I mean, uh, if you compare the cost of uh, emissions reduction, uh, say in a country like Colombia, uh, the range is between 7.7 .7 and 12.7 of uh, GDP. Compared that to Europe, the United States is about essentially the double of that. So these countries, it's is, is easy to think, where are, go, are, where are these countries that are facing the physical, the transition risks, where are they going to uh, finance these, uh, these needs? And add to this issue um, an aspect which I think is, is very important and we, we mentioned it in this last two days very tangentially, which is the difference in the cost of capital. Um, whereas in the advanced economies, the ones, this is the G7 on the left, the cost of capital has been falling. Here is essentially the cost of uh, interest rate uh, uh, paid on public debt. Um, um, it has been increasing for uh, emerging and developing countries. And there are many reasons for that. This is an area that is being explored, uh, has to do uh, with uh, differential in savings, has to do with differential in investment rates, has to do with demographics. I mean, it has a lot of uh, ingredients. But certainly, we're facing this situation in the context of, uh, of, uh, of uh, an increased uh, cost of, uh, of uh, uh, the existing debt in emerging and developing countries. Um, and I think um, this, is, this is only getting uh, worse. So let me end with uh, some comments on, on global policy action. Again, highlighting inconsistencies, asymmetries, tensions. Um, on global carbon taxes, um, I think the idea is good. Um, the differential rates is, uh, I, is, is the only way to make it viable. But we have to acknowledge that this will involve gradualism. This will require distributional incentives, compensating the, the, the ones that are be, uh, affected the most, uh, rules, um, tax-free allowances, sectors that are quite important for certain countries that have to be exempted. 
And this will be, in my way, only viable with the financing, with the support, with the flows. Um, and uh, unless uh, there is clear action, say at the level of the multi uh, multilateral development banks or regional development banks or basically uh, donors support, um, it's gonna be very hard to implement this. On industrial policies, I think the message, I'll, I'll, my, my takeaway of this conference is the, both the IRA and the Green Industrial uh, Plan for net, the Net Zero Age in, in Europe, they make a lot of sense from the point of view of industrial policies, jobs, generating new technologies, uh, uh, economic growth. Um, they make less sense when you start thinking about other goals. Uh, like, for example, uh, uh, de-risking, decoupling, uh, uh, adopting domestic uh, content requirements, um, I think the, they ultimately will end up undermining the efforts in the direction of the, of the reduction uh, in emissions or progress towards net zero. And these are just efforts that with the fiscal capacity that is available in emerging and developing countries are just not replicable. Uh, so um, this is not going to be a race as someone, as some portray a race to the top in terms of who's gonna subsidize the most. You know, the US and Europe can do whatever it takes. Emerging and developing countries can only do whatever they can. So this is a big difference. Um, therefore, thinking about the race with China and using the RA to kind of like change the dynamics of that race could be a goal for the United States but it's not something that is going to really help uh, in terms of the global commons problem. Um, um, CBAM. Um, CBAM, uh, I was uh, asking Jeremy a bit a while ago about the status of this. I guess it's, it's, it's a done deal in Europe, uh, but it's a deal that poses many questions for emerging and developing countries. Where are you gonna draw the line? In scope one or scope two and three emissions? Um, only for intra-industry trade, or are you gonna impact also uh, inter-industry trade? Um, how are you gonna adjust for uh, exports? I mean, a lot of questions. And finally, and I'm gonna end up with this, um, in the development world, um, there is a, kind of like, it's becoming a fad now that uh, the way to kind of like square this uh, circle is uh, by, um, increasing significantly debt for climate swaps. And uh, I really have reservations about that. Um, I think that's not the, uh, clearly not the first best solution. I mean, if, if countries need support, uh, much better to, in general, I mean, there could be exceptions, but much better to have uh, climate condition uh, grants. Um, and, um, and uh, so changing a bit the, the dynamic of that conversation now that we're kind of like just days ahead of the meeting in Paris that uh, President Macron has called, uh, which it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's been kind of like portrayed as a, as a, as a conference where um, these issues are gonna be addressed in terms of the, of the financing. So yes, we need, uh, we need financing, um, uh, we need uh, fresh money and uh, and uh, hopefully for many countries in the world um, in very concessional terms because otherwise they're gonna be able to uh, cope with these challenges. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, I don't have a PowerPoint. Um, so I have to confess also that I'm a political scientist, not a macroeconomist. Uh, but thank you anyway for inviting me to this illustrious conference. I've, I've learned a lot and it's been very interesting. I thought I'd give a few comments, picking up what has been said. Um, and lots of things ha have been mentioned and there's a, a clear overlap and a clear need to, <laughs> to, to discuss further certain issues. But one obvious thought uh, is of course uh, that, that lots of papers and discussions refer to, to WTO, WTO co compat compatibility or non-compatibility or the need for, for WTO rules. 
Uh, the truth is, of course, that, that WHO is very weak right now, and that's uh, one of the reasons why, why this is so difficult to get global agreements. And if we have big um, proposals such as the IRRA and some parts of the EU that could be, or well, some clearly are, non-WHO compatible, um, there, and there is no uh, enforcement to do that, this is, of course, creating a lot of problems, which will have effects for how we fight climate uh, change and how the, all about the, the macroeconomic aspects of this. And if the, the US clearly says that they don't care about the WTO, this has effects for lots of other parts of the world as well, who recently has at least uh, tried to. We hear it even in the European Union right now, who has been the last bastion of trying to defend the rule-based multilateral system. If nobody else cares, why should we? Uh, and this is a very dangerous development uh, that, that I, I see. We saw it also in Indonesia and the nickel export uh, recently. We have seen how difficult it has been to discipline China, even more discipline now, uh, when, when there is no, no discipline neither from, from the US or from, from uh, some parts of the EU as well. And this is uh, extremely complicated because we would need WTO first to, to exercise some discipline using the rules that we have and maybe fine tune them a little, make them more, more adaptable to, to today. And also whether we create a climate club or whether we create some sort of peace clause related to, to CBAM, and I'll come back to that, we would need a forum to, to discuss this. Now WTO has recently taken an initiative together with, the, with the, the World Bank and IMF to map subsidies in the world to give them greater transparency. This might be uh, an important first step to, to use it. And there are committees in the WTO who are working day and night actually very actively, even if it's not very uh, in, in, in the spotlight. And that could be something that uh, results in some minor um, forum where, where to talk about this. But, but this is obviously a very important problem because also Shad and, and uh, Kim's paper refer to some sort of discussion level to discuss that. But the, the truth is that there are very few forums. There's a G7, there's a G20. The Trade and Tech Council could ideally be a place to discuss uh, global or at least transatlantic standards on, uh, on uh, green technology and on, on emissions, but it is, it's not discussed there either. Another point I wanted to, to raise, we heard that Europe is more or less, according to the figure, on the right track, and if everything goes to, to plans, Europe would have done its part of it. The problem right now is that we are approaching elections in many countries nationally, but also in one year there will be elections to the European Parliament, and the biggest group in the European Union, the PP, EPP group, have just said that, you know, maybe we are going a little bit too far, a bit too fast on some of these uh, proposals. Maybe we should put on the brake a little bit because our citizens are not really coping uh, with it. It costs too much. We have so much other things to, to discuss. We have inflation. We have high energy prices. They're going down, down slightly, but it's still a problem in, in many countries, and this is used also in some of the national uh, elections. So if all these plans uh, are being held up by, by politics, this would, of course, have, uh, have uh, considerable effects. And the last thing I wanted to bring up, and that is CBAM, also our former uh, co-panelists ha have talked about this. I mean, the CBAM, we've talked about this uh, a long time. It's, it's part of the Fit for 55, uh, the EU strategy to get fit when you have turned 55, right? Uh, and it uh, includes a lot of different parts of legislations with the aim to become the world's first climate neutral continent by 2050. And there's a whole range of proposals. Some of them are already decided and, and stamped and, and put into motion. Others are still being negotiated. And it, it, it uh, spans from, from forestry to agriculture to infrastructure, renewable energy, buildings, uh, social climate fund uh, with distribution of vulnerable households and micro companies, etc., etc. And the most controversial part of this is, of course, the, the, the CBAM, which builds on the uh, ETS system, as, as all of you have talked about. And uh, I agree, and you said it also, both Mauricio and, and Suma, that, that you know, taxing carbon is, is, is a good thing in theory. Uh, and the CBAM intends, from an EU point of view, to address the carbon leakage and to address what is perceived as a discriminatory uh, decisions today, because 
EU, has, EU producers have to pay uh, a higher price than, than others with more dirty industries. Mm -hmm. So the CBAM would ensure that the price of imports reflects more accurately the carbon content, and that would be in the whole, whole range. And it would be done through certificates corresponding to the carbon price that would have been to, uh, paid had the goods been, been um, equiv equivalent to had the goods been produced under the EU carbon pricing rules. So this will affect cement, steel, fertilizers, aluminium, and electricity. And the European Parliament has uh, added hydrogen and uh, a few other specific uh, goals, but has also pointed at that this could, you know, should be revised regularly and the list should ma be made longer uh, in the future as well, which adds to the insecurity that a lot of countries around the world are perceiving as well. So uh, it will mirror WTO rules. It will be non-discriminatory uh, as the EU uh, free allowances of ETS will be phased out. The euro is still out whether this is fully uh, WTO compatible or not, but this is at least the, the intention. So this will, of course, have consequences. We have seen that the US is skeptical. We have seen that China will take it to the WTO. We have heard reserves from, from India and others. And the most affected countries, as it looks today, would be in order Russia, China, UK, Norway, Turkey, Switzerland, Ukraine, India, South Korea, and the US. Norway and Switzerland are excluded from the system because they're part of, of the internal market. And the US exports are only 3%, actually. Ukraine, well, the biggest steel factory in, in, in Ukraine doesn't exist anymore. So we'll see what, what uh, uh, about uh, them. But it disproportionately affects the global south. Uh, there is a study done by UNCTAD and, uh, and uh, another one by the African Climate Foundation that has shown that Mozambique is actually the country that will be mostly affected in the world. For, uh, and also that Ghana and Zimbabwe and a few others in, in Africa will be very affected because their part of export is so big. So it will, will be affected. And this, according to the same report, could have the effect of reducing Africa's export to the EU by up to 5.7%, which would be the equivalent to 0.9% of Africa's GDP on average, which, if, of course, if you look into individual countries, uh, could, could be a lot. It will be lots of jobs. Uh, it would be, um, could have a, a lot of, of consequential uh, consequences uh, as well. And this is due both because there is no uh, financing to invest in the cleaner technology, of course, and cleaner energy system that would make it possible to reduce the carbon footprint. This is costly and complex. But there is also very tough demands in the CBAN on how to report the whole, uh, uh, the whole steps. You, re you refer to them as well. What um, and you need a lot of statistics. You need a lot of information, and you need uh, you need specific um, qualifications to do that. This is also costly to build up in certain countries. And to, to this comes the insecurity. Maybe in a few years there will be five, six other products being included in the scheme uh, as well. So this is of course uh, having um, macroeconomic consequences, but it's also having geopolitical consequences because some of the countries that I mentioned are uh, neighboring and candidate countries. Turkey, Ukraine, Serbia, Macedonia, Northern Macedonia, Mac Montenegro, Albania, and uh, Moldova. So this will create fractions and complicate negotiations when it comes to enlargement. And other countries, I mentioned Mozambique, Ghana, Zimbabwe, there are others uh, as well. Uh, they, uh, there's already a, um, a geopolitical tension between the EU and the West, if I may say, and the Global South when it comes to the, the, the view on Russia and the, the refusal of, of having a clearer stand against Russia in the war in, in Ukraine. So this risks to reinforce these feelings. So what can be done? Well, EU is encouraging some countries to develop a carbon pricing on their own. This is happening in Argentina, Mexico, Chile, Colombia, as we heard, South Africa, but it's rather modest. Uh, and then there are provisions. The CBAM will enter into force in its first step in October this year. It is decided. And during that first step, there would be a transition where you sort of reach out to uh, partners to see what, what needs to be done to, to prepare. So this is provided for, even if it's rather vague, how it will, will happen. 
You could, of course, agree to have a special and differential uh, treatment to the poorest one, and you could agree uh, to have the revenues to support the transition in the least developing countries to be used as green finances in this. So CBAN estimates to, to, um, to gather between one and a half and three billion euros per year. So of course, some of this could be used, but it is already sort of credited for in, in the EU system for a lot of other things uh, as well. So this is not only a macroeconomic risk globally, if we talk about uh, almost 1% of Africa's uh, GDP, but it also risks to have uh, severe uh, geopolitical consequences. I'll stop there. Thank you. All right. Uh, I wanted to start with thanks to Adam and John for inviting me, but I guess kind of qualified thanks because you've given me a hard job. Uh, I am the last speaker on the last panel, and I am also in some ways representing the U.S., and we've spent the last day and a half beating up on the Inflation Reduction Act and, and the U.S., so I wanted to start with kind of some personal observations on the Inflation Reduction Act. As Adam mentioned, I served in the Biden administration in the Treasury. And during the summer of 22, I was working hard on sanctions on Russia, specifically on the price cap on Russian oil. And so we were traveling around to a bunch of international partners and talking to them about sanctions. And we were traveling when the, the Manchin-Schumer announcement came out about the Inflation Reduction Act. And the meetings with our foreign counterparts just changed dramatically. There was this kind of visible sigh of relief that the US was back at the table and that we had done something serious to address climate change. I think the second question out of people's mouths was, and, and you know this is obvious after the fact, we were the Biden administration, we were there, we care about climate change, but we were interacting with people who had dealt with our predecessors, and they were just saying, you know, what's gonna happen? You guys are only here for so long. The next time a Republican comes to, into office, is the Inflation Reduction Act gonna disappear? And so here, I, I think, is part of the, the beauty, really, of the Inflation Reduction Act, is I don't think that it will be repealed. I think that a lot of the investment that we're seeing, the administration came out with a map just this morning, a lot of the investment is going to be in, in red states. That's where a lot of the wind potential is. That's where a lot of the solar potential is. And so, you know, down the road, I suspect even if there is a Republican in the executive office, even if the Republicans control um, parts of Congress, you know, will Grassley or an uh, Iowa Republican really vote to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act, given that there's so much wind potential in, in Iowa? Mm -hmm. So I, I think this is important to keep in mind because, uh, as we've been talking about, our trade partners' initial enthusiasm for the Inflation Reduction Act waned when they started reading the fine print and, and read about the domestic content provisions and you know the, the, the less trade friendly parts of the Inflation Reduction Act. So as we've talked about, you know, this became an, an issue. It took a little while though, just as a side note, Kim and I were pitching our paper, the, the Journal of Economics Perspective paper to the, the JEP in October and saying, we think it'll be an issue that the US is taking this subsidy-based approach and the mm -hmm. EU and a lot of other countries are taking this cost-based approach. But at that point, we hadn't really heard from people. So you know, it took until December, um, definitely a lot of commentary in, in January at the Davos meetings. But um, so I think it's important to highlight that there are, are two things, two fundamentally different things that, that our trade partners are worried about. One, and the one that's gained the most attention, are the domestic content provisions, the things like the electric vehicle subsidies, which are only available except for the leasing provision that Kim mentioned, if the car is manufactured, um, if the final assembly of the vehicle takes place in, in North America. What Kim and I highlight in our, our Journal of Economics Perspective piece, though, is that what's more fundamental is the difference is the cost-based approach versus the subsidy-based approach. So even if all the domestic content provisions were removed, there, there still is just this, this fundamental difference in approach. And I, I hear 
I, th I think that they are not rounding error. I think that they are potentially big. And so I, I'm taking a little bit of the different side on this than, than Jeremy. But for instance, the Boston Consulting Group, the, the same presentation that Jen Harris cited this morning, they have a calculation about the cost of making low carbon steel in Germany compared to the cost of making low carbon steel in the US. And it's 43% cheaper in the US. And, and this is quite low carbon steel. I think that's the good news here, that steel made with dirty technologies, it's like two tons of CO2 per ton of steel. We can get it down to 0 0.15. But with the subsidies for carbon capture and sequestration and in the Inflation Reduction Act, with the, the subsidies for uh, hydrogen, it, it'll just be dramatically cheaper in the US. So not rounding error. Uh, so we've heard a lot from the Europeans. I guess one thing I'm surprised about is we haven't heard from the, the Canadians yet. So I think that the fact that people are focused on the domestic content provisions, the Canadians are exempt from those because of the free trade agreements, means that it's going to take a little bit more time and then the, the Canadians will realize that some similar dynamics will exist in, in steel production in Canada versus steel production in the U.S. Uh, um, on the other hand, I think it's important to emphasize, and we've heard all these stories about companies that are uh, deciding not to open up factories in the EU, moving to the, the US. There are other dynamics at play here. The, the EU has been experiencing very high natural gas prices. The US has had the benefit of very low natural gas prices that will likely persist. You know, We're building more LNG export capacity, we will be more connected with the rest of the world, but, but we'll be, you know, for the foreseeable future, we will have lower gas prices. So what do we do about these tensions and, and these different approaches? I wanted to offer three solutions, potential solutions. Um, these have all been discussed, but, but I think I have a couple new things to say. So the most obvious thing to do is to price carbon in the United States. And here, I wanted to emphasize two points. One is the carbon pricing in the United States does not have to be economy-wide. We can start, we can exclude transportation fuels. We can exclude lots of sectors. If we started with the sectors that um, Cecilia mentioned that are being covered by the EU CBAM, you know, if we went with steel, cement, that would be basically completely imper or, or imperceptible to consumers. And so hopefully would be political, politically more viable. And secondly, the carbon pricing in the US doesn't have to be immediate. So for instance, as Kim mentioned in 2025, the Trump tax cuts are gonna expire. There may be fiscal pressures for uh, things that raise revenue. The, the other thing that's happening is that the Inflation Reduction Act if, if I'm right, it won't be repealed, but it's only around for so long. And specific plants under the Inflation Reduction Act are only able to collect subsidies for time limited period. So for instance, uh, one of the, the things that the Inflation Reduction Act has, has big subsidies for is carbon capture and sequestration. If you build a carbon capture and sequestration plant, mm -hmm. and basically, if you have a power plant, you have to kind of build a second power plant next to it to do the carbon capture and sequestration. This is a non-trivial -tri capital investment. It's also non-trivial variable cost of operating it. So the Inflation Reduction Act offers $85 a ton subsidies for that CCS, uh, for, for operating the CCS. But if, you're, if you've done this, you know, built the second power plant next to your existing power plant, you can only collect that under the Inflation Reduction Act for 12 years. And so what happens at the end of the 12 years, you know, maybe we extend the subsidies, and historically the US has not been very good at getting rid of subsidies, but if we're achieving our goals and we're building more CCS plants and we're building more wind and solar, at, at a certain point we're just like subsidizing our whole energy sector, and so that strikes me as not very, fiscally viable or, or politically viable. So imagine you know, if in 2025 we introduced a carbon price that came into play in 2030 or some, some point in the future, then the investment calculus for somebody building a CCS plant is I've got the 12 years of the IRA 
And then I've got the benefit of avoiding the carbon price. And so that the, you know, it becomes a, a even better investment to make. And it, the carbon price is very complementary with, with IRA. Um, so I learned while I was in DC, I learned the phrase hope casting instead of forecasting. And so potentially this is me hope casting that, that we have the, the ability to do carbon pricing in the US. But I think there are a couple reasons. Um, one, as I said, it's complementary to IRA. IRA is already doing the work of shifting the burden of the climate transition away from the electricity rate payers, away from energy producers onto the backs of taxpayers. And so, you know, that leaves us some room to, to impose prices or impose costs. Um, and also, as we've mentioned, the, the fiscal belt tightening. So I think there are a couple routes to carbon pricing. For instance, the uh, Senator White House has a bill, the Clean Competition Act, that basically levies a CBAM of a, the U.S. Um, a, a U.S. CBAM, and ties it to basically carbon pricing. He doesn't call it that because of the political sensitivity on U.S. production that's above the the mean and then lowers the threshold where the U.S. is priced over time, which, which is really clever, I think. Uh, so, I, you know, that's the ideal solution is that we see some convergence in approaches that, that the U.S. takes versus what our, our trade partners are taking. The second, and we've discussed this over the course of the day and a half, is focus on technology transfer. The Inflation Reduction Act does have great subsidies for some really cutting edge nascent technologies like direct air capture, like carbon capture and sequestration, like clean hydrogen. You know, if we can succeed in, in driving those technologies down a learning curve, there will be huge benefits to the rest of the world. And so we need to think about how, how those benefits spill over. Um, the third approach, and, and Kim also addressed this, we have a forthcoming policy brief where we suggest that the EU, the US, and potentially more energy consumers focus on areas where we are seeing eye to eye. So the Inflation Reduction Act, in fact, contains a greenhouse gas price. It's a price on methane, not a price on, on CO2. So we think that there is scope for the EU and the US to kind of build the, the muscle, develop the relationships of, of working together on this area where we see common ground, and hopefully those, um, you know, the, those interactions will spill over and, and lay the groundwork for more extensive cooperation. So I think just as a bottom line, I, I would like to encourage economists to uh, remember Biden's phrase that we don't want to he says, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. So I think we need to remember that we need to compare IRA to the alternative and, and not to the almighty. The almighty, this has also come up, so I have a paper with John Beislein and Neil Marotra where we calculate the carbon price equivalent of the IRA and it is like $10, it's one-fifth, one-sixth the cost of, of what IRA is. So that's clearly the almighty. But we also compare that the cost per ton of reduction in IRA to the social cost of carbon, and the IRA is, is hugely cost beneficial, even at the levels um, of, of expenditures that have been projected, like you know the trillion dollars rather than the, the CBO numbers. So IRA, IRA is here. We're going to be living with it. But I think we should be pitching we should be thinking about working with IRA and layering carbon pricing on, on, on top of, of IRA. I think we have, you know, as it's come up, we have the moral imperative to figure out the most efficient way to address climate change and to, to work with the rest of the world on that. So hopefully, hopefully we have scope to do that. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you all our speakers. Um, as we are getting near the end of the, the actual program, uh, and I think Catherine was perfectly interesting and not burdened by being at the end. Thank you for batting clean up. Uh, let me reward our uh, hearty, or hardy, I guess, uh, audience members by turning to them for questions. If Anyone would like to be first? Yes, please. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. There's a really a fascinating panel. Thanks to all of the, the speakers. Uh, first, I want to reassure you on, on Mozambique. Uh, I think a lot of the numbers we see also floating are, are very uncertain. And, and this number that you quoted on the impact on Mozambique takes the av global average carbon intensity of doing aluminum in the world. But Mozambique, of course, does it with hydropower. So if anything, uh, Mozambique might be benefiting from CBAM and not, not being hurt. So I, I think this is something we see in our simulations of CBAM, that you have this reallocation of exporters. And we found the same thing on Turkey, where it's a lot of sectors actually benefiting because carbon intensity is lower in Turkey compared with other countries exporting to, uh, to Europe. So the, how this will happen is, is, is really complicated. And we, we see a lot of assessments that we have to take with, with a lot of care. Uh, my main question was on the investment needs that um, uh, we have shown for a lot of Latin American countries and, and India in the first presentations. So there is this delta because we want to build more resilient, because we want to build low carbon. One question is countries don't invest enough in their development already. So we're not starting from a perfect situation and we just need that delta. The question is how can we imagine climate finance and like a new pact or however you want to call it as a way to fix not only the climate delta, but more generally the lack of investments and the deal, I mean, we're lagging on SDGs because we're not investing enough. So beyond these climate needs, can we have like a, a broader perspective and, and look at how we can help with the development challenge in general? Because I think it, if we're looking only at 10% of, of what we need in total, even if we close that gap and provide this 10%, we're still left with a 90% gap that we need to be closed somehow. So any, any views on, on how to make this connection better? Please, Mauricio. Yeah, well, we can spend hours and hours trying to define the architecture that will allow that to happen, which is essentially achieving all the developmental goals, which is not just climate, but also the SDGs. But I think this, that, that will be too ambitious. I think we should start from something basic. And there's something that is on the table right now, which is the possibility of using the SDRs uh, that were issued uh, to capitalize the uh, development banks. I think that would be a good way to start. I mean, um, while we create the plan that you're hoping for, uh, maybe it's, it's, it's gonna be too late. So, I'll just throw that idea, which is relatively simple, but there's huge obstacle. Uh, and then there's a huge obstacle on the part of, uh, of uh, many of the central banks of the advanced economy. Thank you. Suman? Um, I just want to make sure um, that I understood uh, uh, the, the, the question. I mean, India's uh, gross fixed capital formation rate is at the moment uh, in the high 20s. Uh, and uh, uh, it has been the thrust of this government to invest a lot in infrastructure. So uh, when you, um, you know, when you talk of the, the development gap, uh, it comes back in some way to my current account deficit point, which is that, yes, you can be doing things on the tax rate if you want to generate more domestic savings. Uh, but uh, I, I think there are efficiency of public uh, spending issues. So uh, I'm not sure that I would necessarily focus only on the investment rate. Um, and that's where, as it were, the entire complex of interaction between uh, a sovereign, the fund, the bank, the advice uh, uh, comes, comes about. I mean, there's a dialogue that is meant to optimize both the revenue side and the expenditure side. Now, it's a different matter that uh, some of this is seen as irksome and may be ignored. And it's also the case that over time, uh, certainly talking about uh, the, the World Bank and more broadly, uh, these have become 
a relatively insignificant part of the investment financing. Um, so there's the, you know, the usual trade-off that countries are, uh, democracies are responsive to their, uh, their electorates and there is a process that leads to uh, the quality of taxation and the quality of public expenditure. International organizations have a duty to point out where there are departures from optimality. Uh, but, you know, if you were to ask me, would you rather be a 26 or 28 percent, oh, 30 percent investing country, or would you rather have the problems of a China and have savings uh, that lead you to invest 50 percent? I think there's more likely to be efficient capital allocation if you are somewhat savings constrained than, than the, others, the, the other uh, end of the spectrum. Thank you. Cecilia or Catherine? No, just um, I'm happy to compare notes on, on Mozambique. I have several different sources. But, but you have a very good point saying that there's a lot of anecdotal sort of truth circulating in, in, in this whole debate. And that's why it's so important that the EU uses this time until it actually enters into force, it has already started, of course, to really enter into dialogue with all potential uh, countries who, you know, who will be affected by it to see what, to what extent will it be, what could be the other benefits, what, how can we compensate, uh, so that you get the full picture before it actually enters into force. Uh, and in that, you know, work from, from World Bank and others will be extremely important uh, as well. I guess I would just, since it hasn't come up yet on the panel, I think I'd just emphasize the role of, of adaptation. And so investments that help encourage development are going to help with adaptation. You know, access to energy use or access to energy is, is a really important part of, of adaptation. You can have fans, you can run air conditioners. So, uh, yeah. I. I Reminder that even investments that that don't ostensibly have to do with climate change, but are or climate change mitigation at least, but that are encouraging development, are are going to help with adaptation. Thank you. Uh, another question, please. Could you go to the mic right there? Uh, Chad Baum Peterson, um, Catherine. Question for you. So I think of everybody you've thought hardest about, at least on the U.S. side, the the. Complement, potential complementarities, how we get to carbon pricing eventually, and I appreciate very much you sort of laying out a positive agenda and how we might foresee it. But I imagine you've also probably thought through some of the pitfalls um, of what might come up along the way that we might need to watch out for. So can you tell us a little bit about those? Something, you know, do we need to worry about new, new industries, new political economy evolving that's gonna, you know, create roadblocks that are gonna prevent us 10 years from now to, to getting to carbon pricing. Um, what should we be worried about? Doesn't seem like it's just gonna happen naturally. Yeah, easy question. <laughs> I mean, yeah, in, in general, I think we should be worrying and this room should be worrying about the devaluation of economic thought in the, the, the whole discourse. Um, yeah, I mean, culture wars have nothing to do with economics, and that's what the Republicans are waging right now. And to the extent that mitigation or win becomes part of the culture wars, and even if it makes economic sense to them, the Republicans are are fighting against investments in climate change. I, I think that's you know that's one big potential drawback. Okay, next, please. Alain Dessert, uh, OECD. I have a question for Mauricio. Uh, you mentioned at some point the, the fact that in Latin America there was a lot of low cost, uh, low abatement cost of a, low cost abatement opportunities through afforestation and, and land use. And you later mentioned as well that uh, it would be preferable to have climate uh, conditional um, grants as opposed to climate debt swap. So my question is, how much scope do you see for the carbon markets to fill some of this gap? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, carbon market, I mean, carbon markets are uh, relatively small compared to, um, um, to um, what the needs are in terms of the reduction of emission. Um, and of course, there is a great hope that they can increase. 
to the trillions of dollars to, to solve that problem. However, when you dig deep into carbon markets, you start seeing a lot of market failures, um, beginning with the most basic one, which is property rights of the land. But enforcement, technology, um, there is a, uh, a lot of distrust these days on these agencies that do the auditing on the uh, carbon credits. So a lot of work needs to be done. There are two directions in which this can go. One is more market driven, companies that need offsets, individuals that prepare projects in the Amazon, uh, but they have to deal with all these, all these problems, these complexities. Then there's another approach, which is more the jurisdictional approach, which is you go about regions. Uh, kind of what I was asking yesterday, Andrew Steer, about Gabon. So it's a, it's a, it's a big national effort, um, and that, is, uh, that involves more uh, donors' money and, and, and uh, you know, uh, cooperation, IDA, et cetera. So there, there, there are these two approaches, but uh, there is a, I think that's where the greatest opportunities are, really in terms of not just uh, abating emissions, but also avoiding. Because uh, avoidance can be a huge thing uh, if we just stop uh, deforestation. But we need to start thinking about the, the market failures that have prevented that from happening. Great. Uh, anyone else with a question or a comment? Suman or Mauricio, anything you want to come back to your fellow panelists on? Yeah. I just want to make a, two quick points. One on, on Stefan, uh, good question about Mozambique. Um, which input output matrix is going to be used to calculate the missions? Germany's, Italy's, Mozambique, Turkey? That's, that's question number one. Uh, question number two is, um, this is, this is going to, um, it's, it's been portrayed as the, the rationale is the leakages. So I think the first best solution will be the carbon pricing in all the jurisdictions. Uh, create incentives for that to happen. So this is a little bit about whether it's stick or carrot. I'd rather go with the carrot strategy, which is like South Africa. I give you this, I give you this support, say the loss and damage fund, or any other, any other type of, uh, of benefit, but you have to do this. You have to uh, implement carb, uh, carbon pricing. So I think that's, that's one element. And the other the, the quick comment, so I just don't speak anymore, is we talk about adaptation and mitigation as two kind of like separate subjects. Um, for the rest of the world, the, the focus of, of uh, this panel, uh, adaptation is huge in terms of the of the capex. It's not in the numbers I mentioned. The numbers I mentioned is just about mitigation. So adaptation is huge. So we need to start thinking about uh, how to increase investment in adaptation, but especially adaptation that is compatible with mitigation, because there is also trade off. There is also tensions between adaptation and mitigation, and we need to start working on uh, analytically on on which are the actions where adaptation and mitigation are complementary, which are the ones. Uh, where there are uh, trade-offs and, and, and try to uh, favor those ones where there is comp complementarity. Thank you. Suman? Uh, yeah, just uh, two points. Uh, one is that, uh, of course, everybody now talks about um, um, the Paris Agreement, uh, but all of this and the COPs are embedded in the UNFCCC, and that was the recognition that, uh, you know, climate change uh, was a global challenge, and that's what led to uh, special but differentiated responsibility. But I think uh, I'm right in saying that the UNFCCC also talked about the transfer of technology. And I think that that will be a very important part of the carrots for the global south to, uh, uh, to uh, make their contribution. <clears throat> and I'm not entirely clear either in US legislation, and here I know a bit more about the vaccination story, uh, but 
you know, a lot of uh, certainly US and I think European um, clean research starts off as government funded, uh, as was the case with, uh, 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 with the vaccines that started in DARPA. Uh, okay. Now, to my knowledge, in Sweden, if there's a government contribution to research, uh, the Swedish state retains some of the IPR, whereas my understanding is that uh, the US attitude is basically that the IPR then vests in whoever commercializes it. And so the issue of what is the framework, either in Europe or in Japan or in the United States, for coaxing, as it were, uh, the commercializers of technology to share that on advantageous terms uh, is not something I've heard that much discussed, but it could be a quite important part of the carrot. And secondly, uh, uh, just to say that, uh, I mean, and these are the issues that Europe has faced, uh, that, you know, the fiscal federalism issues that would arise in uh, a federal society like uh, India, uh, raised by, as it were, the climate transition. We had a lot of discussion about the spatial dimensions in Europe, but exactly what that means about the architecture of, uh, uh, of relations in a transition between the center and the states uh, is something we're going to be wrestling with, and it'd be interesting to see exactly uh, well, the, Europe has, uh, as was discussed yesterday, uh, experience with regional policies. Um, and all I'm saying is that uh, the, uh, uh, the appropriate tweaking of uh, intergo intergovernmental fiscal relations is another challenge, but it's a domestic challenge. It's not a cross-border challenge. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, Cecilia? Just one one final thought on, on carrots and sticks. I think, as any parent knows, that they work very well together. Uh, um, and in some ways, like, the, the best stick is one that you never have to actually wield. So I think in some ways that the best CBAM is, is one that never actually gets assessed, that it's just there. And it encourages countries to think about carbon pricing themselves. I mean, I think that's part of the reason that the EU has this really long three-year lead-in period. And, and you know, hopefully there'll be a lot of technical assistance that the World Bank and others are, are offering to countries to, to think about carbon pricing. We um, have looked into this example of Turkey, where, where Turkey was doing the calculus. A lot of their exports go to the EU. And so their industry was going to be paying the carbon price anyways, 50% or something was going to the EU. And so Turkey figured, we'll just assess our own carbon price and collect the revenue that, that rather than having the Europeans collect it, we'll collect it. So, you know, I think there is this virtuous cycle where CBAMs encourage other CBAMs and then nobody has to actually, CBAMs encourage carbon pricing, then no one actually has to enact a CBAM or use a CBAM. Thank you. So with that hopeful note, um, I, 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 I will just say what, one thing I need to say. Uh, Catherine uh, made a great contribution to this panel, but she opened by saying, you know, she felt like we, people have been beating up on the IRA. I, I think we had Jennifer Harris speaking earlier. We had uh, Andrew Steer last night. We had a lot of actual optimism about the US IRA. It's not uncontroversial. It doesn't deserve to be uncontroversial. But this was hardly a, a session of repeated beating up on the IRA. Um, and therefore, that leaves our audience here in person and globally to make up their own minds. I have a few housekeeping organizational things, but to end most importantly on substance before I do those in our online viewers can tune out. Let me call on John Pisani Ferry, who was the intellectual backbone of everything we did the last couple of days, to give a few concluding remarks.
fortunately, I wasn't the only intellectual back backbone, and uh, you know, success has uh, many, many fathers, and especially you, and thank you, Adam, for uh, making it possible. Um, we thought of this conference as a way to sort of uh, mobilize research uh, and learn from uh, its insights and learn from the discussion. And really, huge thanks for all who have been here, who are still here uh, in, the, in this last session, um, because we haven't been disappointed at all. I mean, this has been a, a, great, a great conference. Um, I have a few uh, takeaways. Uh, you know, I thought perhaps it would be interested to give you my takeaways, although I did that a bit this morning. Um, I, I'll be quick. Um, the first um, is that whatever the divergent views uh, there are on uh, um, the, the economic implication of the transition, and we don't uh, yet uh, agree fully on that, uh, we all agree that the, the alternative of no action would be far worse. And I think that was repeating, uh, certainly. Um, the, the second point is that um, in the long run, uh, there is probably no trade-off between growth and uh, climate action. Uh, we can have both. We can have a greener economy and a growing economy. Um, third point, the battle for climate, and this was very apparent in the discussion on, on Ryan Hilder's paper and also on, on, on Philip's contribution, will be fought and won or lost on the innovation front. This is what, in the end, will determine whether there will be adoption, there will be generalized adoption. Uh, it's when the green goods are getting cheaper more efficient, more adapted, that uh, <clears throat> there will be, uh, the jury will, will finally, uh, you know, uh, stop being out and, uh, and uh, deliver its verdict. Um, we're speaking, in fact, of, uh, of an industrial revolution. I think we, this hasn't been mentioned so much, but it's really an industrial revolution it's an industrial revolution. The difference with those of the past is that it's taking place, or is it bound to take place at warp, warp speed and be driven by policy instead of exclusively technology. So that's the challenge, is to succeed in this um, industrial revolution. Um, the global economic uh, implications of climate action are likely first order for a number of variables, speaking of output, speaking of inflation, speaking of international trade, uh, speaking of balances of payment, uh, but we are still far from having a full understanding of how those things are going to, to play out. I mean, um, definitely um, in part because we're not at the frontier, we're not starting from a, a situation where Economies can be regarded as being a, as the efficiency frontier. Um, so uh, clearly, some work remains to be done on that front. Um, that applies also to the fiscal equation. Uh, we had discussions on the fiscal implication of climate action. Um, they are some see them as, as positive, some see them as negative. Uh, in part, uh, this is also because we're starting from very different uh, perspectives. Um, the, uh, the feasibility space also is, is viable, depends on, on the judgment, on the political feasibility of some, uh, some reforms. We spoke extensively about the possibility of uh, removing uh, fossil fuel subsidies, of uh, taxing carbon, etc. Uh, so for the fiscal equation, it matters, and the only answer to the question that was the title of the session, uh, I think, is it depends, and it still depends. Um, the climate uh, transition, uh, you have, have one regret, is that we haven't addressed sufficiently this dimension. Uh, the inequality uh, between nations, it has been addressed in the last panel, 
within nations, it hasn't been addressed so much. Uh, but uh, I think it is first order, and it is, from a political economy standpoint, it is vital that uh, it is being uh, given sufficient attention because we all know that this is where um, the, uh, you know, the, the test, the, the final test of the feasibility of the policy will be, uh, will be delivered. Um, the labor market implications of a green transition, we discussed that in the uh, session with uh, Robert Lawrence. Uh, interestingly, uh, there was no uh, disagreement. We all agreed that uh, they are, you know, in principle, relatively minor, but in fact, they can uh, be a stumbling block, a significant stumbling block, and so they need to be given uh, sufficient attention and sufficient resources have to be devoted uh, to that. Um, the Global South, we just spoke about uh, it, and um, with Suman especially and, and Mauricio, uh, um, the Global South is vulnerable to transition risk. Uh, there is no, 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 no doubt about that. Uh, investment uh, needs are major. I think I was, uh, I was amazed by the numbers you gave. Um, and external financing is scarce. Fiscal space is limited. So the challenges are, are high, and uh, this dimension, I think, deserves much more attention and hopefully um, the, it, it, will, it will get more attention and, and especially the, the rich country will uh, finally deliver on their, on their pledges. Last, last I mentioned the heterogeneity of climate policies, it's, it's here to stay. Um, I think we've made progress in understanding how to sort of um, accommodate this uh, uh, divergence. Um, it's not an easy task because the multilateral system is not in good shape, it's exceptionally fragile, we can't rely much on the WTO. So the, the, the solution proposed by Chad and, and Kim is sort of to emulate the WTO by, uh, you know, starting with a limited number of countries and, and, and using the principles of the WTO um, to replicate them. I think that's a very clever solution. Um, so best hope is that uh, UID get some traction. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, and thank you all for the appropriate applause for Jean and everyone. Um, our online viewers may want to drop out now. I'm now just going to say for the record how we're going to carry forward some of this work and obviously all authors and participants will get this in writing but just so nobody can accuse the institute of not being transparent in our goals um john and i will be working on building off of his recent just completed remarks a set of quick takeaways uh we think from this conference partly to follow up on the attention that we think it's generated, partly to engage all of you. Uh, we hope to circulate that internally next month and then to all of you as soon as possible after that. Um, we are going to ask all paper writers on the program uh, to give us some version of their paper. Uh, we stand by with our full editorial support to help you achieve that, and we'll provide transcripts of the discussants and the other conversations if you in your own presentation if you would like. Uh, we are flexible as to whether these may take the form of PIE policy briefs or working papers, but we will ask you to do those. Um, the goal is to have two bites at the apple to use the expression of avoiding food waste um, that first each author contributors or group of contributors papers will be published separately by PIE and that will allow us to promote in the way that we do with PIE charts, with perhaps discussions in Cecilia or Nicola or Chad's event series with web efforts and so on. And then we will, of course, have a conference volume at the end of the process, not because we want everyone to wait around for a conference volume, but we do believe the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. 
and there should be one reference point for what we all have put together. And the timeline for that is, assuming we can get in everybody's paper in some form by end of September, uh, which is the goal, we should be able to turn around with the help of our amazing publications team, uh, uh, conference volume by before end of first quarter of 2024, possibly well before. So that is the outline. We will process all that and get that to you. Uh, all of you who made the effort to be discussants, uh, if you would like assistance turning your discussion, your deathless pearls of wisdom, into a blog or into even a policy brief, again, we're happy to provide transcripts and work with you on that. There was a lot of good thinking in the discussants. We don't want it to go to waste. And um, other members of the extended PIE community who participated in this, if you would like to get involved, I can't guarantee you a slot in the conference volume, but I can guarantee you a fair hearing and dialogue with our work. So with that, with thanks to Jessica, Sarah, Michal, Femi, JB, uh, Denise, Patricia, Robert, all of whom work, Jose, all of whom work somewhat behind the scenes to make this work, even the clicker. <laughs> I agree, they do good stuff. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks to John, thanks to everyone, we'll be in touch.